want and
I'm ready, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, and I'd like to welcome you to the San Rafael City Council of Monday, November 2nd, 2020. We met in closed session, uh, and I'll ask the city clerk if there was any reportable, or excuse me, the city attorney, if there was any reportable action this evening. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of the community. The council did meet in a uh, closed session this evening. There was no reportable action taken in closed session. Thank you very much. I request city clerk to uh, roll call. Council members present. Council member Bushy. Present. Vice Mayor Collin. Present. Council member Gamblin. Here. Council member McCullough. Here. Mayor Phillips. Hi, all accounted for, and I believe you have a statement. Uh, I'm city attorney, I'm I city do. clerk. I do, thank you. Before we begin, I would like to announce that tonight's city council meeting will include Spanish language simultaneous interpretation provided by a qualified interpreter, Noemi Gonzalez Roca. To listen and provide public comment in Spanish, please, prep, please call 669-900-9128 and enter the meeting ID 816-5225. 5737 pounds. This telephone number is displayed at the bottom of our YouTube video and we will add it to the live chat now. As a reminder, we ask that everyone participating tonight please speak slowly to allow our interpreter to effectively express your comments. And at this time, I'll invite Noemi to interpret the comments that I just made about how to participate in Spanish. Thank you, Lindsay. Antes de empezar, nos gustaría anunciar que en la reunión del Consejo de la Ciudad de esta noche va a incluir interpretación al idioma español, el cual está siendo proporcionado por una intérprete calificada, Noemí González Rocha. Para escuchar y para dar sus comentarios públicos en español, favor de llamar al 669-900-9132. Y de poner el número de la reunión que es 816-5225-5737 y luego prima el símbolo del número. Este número de teléfono también aparecerá al pie de su pantalla en YouTube y también lo agregaremos en este momento a la caja del chat o caja de comentarios. Y como recordatorio, les pedimos a todos los que estén participando esta noche que hablen lentamente para permitirle a nuestra intérprete que pueda expresar sus comentarios de manera efectiva. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Noemi. Also, I'd like to note that this meeting is being streamed live to YouTube where viewers can provide com public comments in a live chat or they're welcome to attend by telephone and calling another meeting number. I'm going to give it to you. It's 669-900-9128. And the meeting ID is 884-8011-5619 pound. Again, that is going to be for English comments. And... Um, We'll go ahead and add that at the bottom of our YouTube channel and it'll also be in the live chat. If you're participating over the telephone and you wish to provide public comments, please press star nine when the mayor opens the public comment period. When it's your time to speak, you will hear a notification that the host is inviting you to speak and you will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you hear the notification that you've been unmuted, you'll have two minutes to speak. If you're submitting comments on YouTube to be read aloud, please write public comment in caps, introduce yourself and, and submit your comments. And please note that there is a character limit on YouTube, so you'll, you'll need to submit your comments in groups. Additionally, if you're planning to, planning to speak to the city council on matters that are not on this evening's agenda, you'll need to submit your comments as soon as possible because they'll be next up uh, on the agenda. And if you've submitted comments prior to the meeting by email or letter, they've been forwarded to the city council and they've been published to our website along with our agenda. And closed captioning is available this evening. We'll go ahead and add that chat and or add that link to the live chat now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you. Will there be an interpretation of uh, that that you just read? We have that on the simultaneous line on our okay. second call line. So okay. anyone who needed interpretation is receiving that already at the same time. 
Thank you for that. Uh, we'll now turn to the city manager's report, Jim. Thank you, mayor and council. I do have a couple updates and announcements and I'd like to start briefly on COVID-19 and I will try to speak more slowly than usual for the interpretation. Um, as the council knows, the COVID-19 statistics have been improving in Marin. And last week on Tuesday, Marin County graduated from red to orange status. Uh, the county moved from red or tier two, which is called substantial risk, to the less restrictive orange or tier three, which is moderate risk. And I wanted to note that moderate risk is different from safe, um, as there still is a risk. As I've heard the county health officer, Dr. Willis, say a few times, there's no green tier uh, or kind of all is well tier. Um, it's purple, red, orange, and yellow because they're trying to indicate that there are diff various levels of risk. So in the new tier that we're in as of last week in orange, it caused a number of uh, different types of businesses to be able to open um, or open at greater capacity. So for example, retail, indoor malls, and office space were allowed to open at full capacity and then 50% uh, capacity were things like indoor restaurants, museums, movie theaters, 25% capacity for things like gyms and fitness centers. And for the first time we saw um, bars and breweries on the list um, allowed outdoors only. So um, all of the details on what's allowed, I think people are familiar by now with marinrecovers.com. As for city services, we offer a really wide range of services. So there are many that have not been impacted um, by which tier that we're in. For example, police, fire, uh, parking, park maintenance, street maintenance, all of those have been going on as, as usual, not bound by the office rules. Um, office is just allowed to be open in this new tier, the orange tier. Uh, and with, with some restrictions and still encouraging telecommuting. So for the non-safety office roles that we have at, at the city, we, are, we will be transitioning over the next couple of weeks into a mix of open for walk-in, like anyone could just come in without an appointment uh, for our customer facing services. Um, we also will offer in-person appointments so you can come and meet with someone at a designated time uh, and we'll be able to limit the amount of, of people through that. And then also we've been doing for many months virtual appointments. So if people prefer to meet with staff virtually, we're still offering that as well. Uh, we, we will see some other services start to open up. For example, our partner, the County of Marin and the city of San Rafael's will most likely um, start with the first library branch that will open will be the one at Northgate Mall uh, around the middle of this month. And the downtown library and the Pickleweed Library will continue curbside service um, as we transition to more opening hours there. For example, at Pickleweed, uh, we have a uh, the computer room, the Pickleweed Library computer room currently has open hours uh, for the public Tuesday through Fridays. So it is going to be a transition period. Um, again, the orange tier doesn't mean everything is, is safe. It means that there's, there's less risk. So we're trying to manage that risk through a number of different ways um, as we continue to provide services to our community. Uh, my next topic is that we have finally made it. Tomorrow is election day. Um, I wanted to mention that there is still time to mail in ballots. They need to be postmarked on or before election day. I did hear recently from the city clerk that um, the last time I heard 63% of voters had already submitted their ballots in Marin. So it's probably more like uh, two thirds or more by now uh, that have already voted. Ballots can be dropped off at polling places. Polls are open tomorrow, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
And if you do need to vote in person at your polling place, it's recommended to go early to help reduce crowds and be prepared in case there are long lines because there are um, masks and social distancing required and cleaning protocols and that sort of thing. Uh, let's see, a list of Dropbox locations is listed in the voter information guide or online at marinvotes.org. So looking back, it was July of this year when the council voted to put on the ballot measure R, um, which is called the San Rafael Emergency Preparedness and Essential Services Protection Measure. And we're finally at that point where we will soon know the outcome of that measure in addition to so many other important races and propositions. Lastly, I wanted to say thank you to the city staff and all of our wonderful community partners. As October was full of virtual events celebrating Dia de los Muertos, and some of the virtual activities had several thousand viewers each, so it was uh, well attended. The events and activities culminated yesterday evening with a car procession through the canal neighborhood. And uh, you, the council probably saw it. For our community that didn't see it, it was a lot of fun watching it on Facebook Live. You can still find it on Facebook. It has some really fantastic music. And uh, one of the benefits of the virtual event is that this is the first year that I did not get candle wax all over my shoes from walking in the event, uh, which I'm not sure if I'm the only one that that happens to, uh, but that did not happen virtually. Uh, the car procession was led by our San Rafael Police and Fire Departments, and there's too many people to adequately thank in the time that I have here, but I did want to call out the organizing committee, starting with their chair, Catherine John, and uh, Steve Mason, our wonderful City of San Rafael Senior Supervisor for the Borough Community Center in Pickleweed Park. I know they both put so much time into this event in addition to other organizing committee members, uh, Douglas Mundo and Claude Crudup of the Multicultural Center of Marin, Elizabeth Seton from Artworks Downtown and the Business Improvement District, um, Lin Yu Diaz, Zoe Harris, and Stephanie Jucker, community residents and artists. Barbara Clifton Zarati from the Marin Community Foundation, and Peter B. Collins from Collins Media Services. Those, that was the organizing committee. And they were joined by many community supporters, such as the Bank of Marin, the Business Improvement District, that was played a role in all of the fantastic um, ofrendas downtown on, on 4th Street, um, Sylvia Bingham Fund, Artworks, I mentioned, the Marine Community Foundation, and so many others. So I apologize if I, if I missed anyone, but it really was a community event with so many individuals and organizations taking part. And it was great to be able to continue to celebrate um, this year, even though it was, it was virtual and not in person. Uh, it was still very meaningful and allowed us to celebrate all month long as opposed to one, one particular day of focus. So I want to um, thank the council and the mayor for the opportunity to provide these updates and announcements and I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, thanks, Jim. And thanks for the very nice and complete report as, as usual. We'll now turn to open time for public expression. This will be an opportunity for you to address us on matters that are not on this evening's agenda, but on your mind. And I'd like to bring to our attention the recommendations or thoughts that you have on, uh, again, those items that are not on this evening's agenda. Now would be an appropriate time. Thank so. you. If you are participating by telephone and you wish to provide uh, or you wish to speak, please press star nine when it is your turn to speak and you'll be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. If you are participating on YouTube, please submit your comments now. And please note that when submitting comments on YouTube, you do need to write public comment prior to your message if you would like it to be read into the record. As a reminder, uh, we ask that you please speak slowly to allow for effective interpretation of your comments into Spanish. And I would just like to note quickly, and we're adding this into the chat as well, that the English meeting ID is 884-8011-5619 pounds. 
Um, so we do have a public comment through YouTube. This is from Salama Locks. She is reporting, Commissioner Locks reporting that the Commission on Aging meeting is this Thursday at 10 a.m. and the topic is going to be COVID-19 and mental health, fresh perspectives. You can call 415-473-7118 for the Zoom link. And we do have a public comment through the telephone, so I will go ahead and ask them to unmute now. If you just received a notification, you will need to press star six. Perfect. Yes, this is Commissioner Locks, and thank you for reading my statement. I also wanted to remind everybody to vote tomorrow if you did not turn in your ballot earlier. And uh, do check the website because there's a consolidation of the polling places and where you had voted previously maybe have been changed. But get out the vote. Thank you. If you've received a notice, there you go. You're unmuted. Oh, is it my turn? Okay. Um, this is Leslie Clore, and I'm a San Rafael citizen, and I work at Community Action Marin. I am the housing navigator there, and I wanted to speak in support of the project Home Key, the sites that you're considering. Um, I'm finding more and more that the clients I'm seeing are older females who are homeless and sleeping in their cars. And that's as well as the moms with their kids that are sleeping in their cars. So homelessness is increasing. And with winter coming, it makes it even more devastating. So I wanted to support the idea of doing the Project Home Key. Um, you're not building new things. You are providing re reassessing buildings that you want to use for this purpose. So I think it's very important. Um, people always feel the property values are going to decline and all sorts of horrors are going to be committed, but that isn't true. We really need more housing for the homeless. And being compassionate people, we don't want to see our friends and neighbors who are on the streets. And also, uh, where black residents are concerned, 40 400% are more likely to experience homelessness than white residents. And we want to have housing for racial justice. So all these things are very compelling to vote yes on this project and allot this money because we don't want to lose the money if we don't um, go for this project. We don't want to miss out on tens of millions of dollars. So this is also an effort to prevent the spread of COVID-19 among our most valuable and vulnerable residents. So the health care crisis is strong, and I want to just advocate with the housing navigation I do and the clients that I see that this is really, really an important necessity. So I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And I do just want to make a reminder that this portion of the agenda will be for items that are not on this evening's agenda. And I do have another speaker. Hi, sorry. I just realized mine is also about an agenda item, so you can pass over me if you'd like. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Peter Mendoza. I, I wasn't able to access the agenda. There was a problem with my internet. Is Project Home Key on the agenda? And if so, I'll wait. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move over to YouTube. We do have a public comment. My name is Lisa Merrigan. I'm a Center Fell resident since 1989. Thank you for your time. I have serious concerns about the proposed closure of the Third Street entrance to Walgreens. We have another public comment regarding the pulling down of this. This is from Name Withheld. 
Regarding the pulling down of the statue at the Mission Church, I believe it does not make sense to charge the participants with a hate crime. What exactly was the hatred? And that concludes public comment at this time. Uh, thank you everyone for your comments. And we'll now turn to the consent calendar. Uh, anyone from the public wish to address us on the consent items? So if you are participating by telephone and you wish to speak on an item on the consent calendar, please press star nine. And then when it's your turn to speak, you'll be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. If you're providing public comments, please write public comment on YouTube and that way we'll know uh, to read your comment aloud. I'm gonna give it about 15 seconds. I do have a caller who wants to confirm that this will be for an item on the consent calendar. Did someone just receive a notification that they've been unmuted? And I see no public comments on YouTube, so that concludes public comment. Thank you and close public and come back to council for uh, uh, first, uh, any item you wish to be held? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask for a comment or perhaps a motion with regard to the three items before us. I move that we adopt the consent calendar. Second. Move and second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye, that matter carries. Moving to other agenda items, 5A, Canal Policy Working Group. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Good evening, I'm Christina Lilovich, Assistant City Manager. I'm here this evening to present you with an update on the work of our recently formed Canal Policy Working Group. This past August, a coalition of local community leaders sent a letter to the San Rafael City Council and to the Marin County Board of Supervisors that highlighted the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our low-income Latinx community in San Rafael and across the county and urged our government officials to take swift action to address this crisis. This coalition of partners who I'll introduce to you in just a moment also recommended the creation of a dedicated canal policy working group that would work on developing both short and long-term solutions together. Members of this working group are, some of which who um, hopefully are on camera at this point, I don't know if I can see everybody's faces, but, but please reveal yourselves. Um, starting with Omar Carrera and Ricardo Huerta Nino with the Canal Alliance, Chandra Alexander with Community Action Marin, and Stephanie Hafner with Legal Aid of Marin. In addition to our community partners, we also have Vice Mayor Kate Collin, Catherine Kufa, and myself with the City of San Rafael, and also Supervisor Dennis Fredoni, Lorenzo Cordova, and Angela Nicholson with the County of Marin are also members of this working group. Following my opening remarks tonight, members of the group will also be speaking and I'll cue them when that time comes up. Uh, on September 18th, the working group convened for the first time. Since then, we've been working together to further explore health, housing, and local business policy initiatives. The approach we're taking as a working group is a highly collaborative, high trust one, and we're, mo we're moving as quickly as we possibly can to really address this um, as the crisis that it is. We're meeting weekly as a group and then smaller subgroups of staff are also meeting more frequently in between. The resolution before you tonight that staff is a recommending for approval represents the city of San Rafael's commitment to address this crisis with great urgency. The resolution also recognizes that the current and historical manifestations of racial injustice have resulted in deeply unequal unequal access to quality housing, employment, healthcare, education, resources, and opportunities. 
And in addition, that the COVID-19 pandemic is having a disproportionate impact on our historically marginalized and under-resourced communities of color who are least able to overcome these deep systemic challenges. Finally, this resolution also confirms the City Council's commitment to protect housing for our essential workers, preserving the ability for many community members to stay in their homes in San Rafael. Trying to make sure that I'm talking slowly enough, so I'm gonna take a breath. Um, one important tool to actually putting this work into action is a recommendation um, to allocate some new funding that's coming from the Community Development uh, block grant specifically around CARES Act coronavirus funding, and that you'll hear more from uh, Ethan Guy in the next staff presentation, so I don't want to steal all of his thunder, um, but that funding recommendation is in support of rental assistance and local businesses in areas of San Rafael that are most at risk for COVID-19 transmission and at most risk for eviction. Um, so before I turn it over to Omar, I'm just going to um, go over a couple of next steps for the working group to kind of fill you in on what's on the horizon for us. One of the biggest concerns we've heard amongst the working group members is the growing debt um, accumulation that our residents are facing as each month goes by, um, as well that, as the impact that this will have on property owners and housing stability in both San Rafael and Marin. So a few action item follow-ups are, we're setting up an informational event for landlords to make sure they're aware of all the rules and regulations related to the current eviction moratorium. We're also analyzing the possibility of providing nonprofit agencies with a first right of refusal on sales of multi-unit properties in the canal. Um, we're currently looking at a program that San Francisco implemented in 2019 and we're working to analyze the impacts of that program and how we may make something like that work here in Marin. We're also exploring the possibility of extending the eviction moratorium at a local level if this is not done at a state level. We're evaluating a possible cap on rent increases that would protect renters for a specific period of time. We're also looking at ways to support access to capital, which is sorely needed to implement some of these programs um, and, and really make this work. Finally, we're drafting uh, a high level policy document that will describe the analysis and make specific staff recommendations to guide the work moving forward. Um, we'll be providing regular updates to the council on our progress. And um, I'd like to allow the other working group members an opportunity to share their remarks before we go to questions, but any and all of us would be happy to, to answer questions or provide follow-up information if you'd like following, um, following the other speakers. So I'll introduce Omar Carrera and we'll take it from there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor and City Council members. We are very excited and very hopeful for the opportunity you are considering tonight. As you know, Marin County has had the unfortunate distinction as the county with the greatest racial disparities in the state. The severe impact of the pandemic on communities of color revealed the consequences of these disparities. We have before us the chance to turn that around and become a leader in racial equity and pandemic recovery in a way that can be a model for other cities and counties. As leaders and elected officials, you are well aware of the devastating impact of the pandemic on essential workers and their families. Only innovations and a collective approach can help avoid the complete displacement of our families out of our communities. The approach presented here tonight includes the right combination of a collaborative approach bringing public, nonprofit, and business together, along with the commitment to innovations for housing solutions. We know housing is a basic comp component of health and well being. Tonight, you have an unprecedented opportunity to adopt policies to close critical gaps in the inadequate, inadequate sorry, state and federal laws and policies. By implementing protections for populations that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. On behalf of the canal community, 
and the multi-sector coalition that I represent, along with my partners at Community Action Marine and Legal Little Marine, we urge you to accept this leadership opportunity and pass the resolution. And we encourage city staff to continue working on the development and implementation of policies to protect our city's essential workers, thereby protecting our local businesses and thriving or a speedy recovery and the return to a thriving community. Thank you for your consideration and support. Thank you, Omar. So, um, Chandra or Stephanie, did you have additional remarks or, or were you speaking as a coalition um, with Omar? Was, yes. We're I speaking was... together. Okay, wonderful. So I'll just turn it over to, thank you very much, all three of you for being here and I'll turn it over to Supervisor Rodoni. Good evening, members of the Centerfield City Council. Thank you for an opportunity to speak to all of you tonight. I'm Dennis Rodoni, District 4 Supervisor on the Marin County Board of Supervisors. I have the privilege and honor of representing the East San Rafael portion of the city of San Rafael. We all share responsibility of representing and advocating for the needs of our most marginalized residents. COVID-19 has amplified the seriousness, the serious inequities that are common in the lives of our residents in the Canal neighborhood. This is the reason that we're all here today. I've been serving as an organizing member of the Canal Policy Working Group since its inception in September. The Canal Policy Working Group is our commitment to our community to de develop real and impactful solutions to the inequities that affect their lives. I am pleased that the city and county have come together to share this accountability and responsibility for these solutions. I look forward this to this continued partnership. <clears throat> Lastly, I'd like to thank Mayor Phillips, Vice Mayor Kate Collins, City Manager Jim Schutz, Assistant City Manager Christina Lilovich, and Catherine Koffa for their great work and help during this process. Through their leadership and hard work, the city of San Rafael's values have come to light. I respectfully ask that you approve this resolution in its entirety. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your comments. And Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those are the comments we are to hear from initially. That's correct, Mr. Okay. Mayor. So we're happy to answer any questions if you have them. Uh, excellent, and then we'll turn to public for public comment, uh, starting with uh, council members. Anyone uh, wish to comment at this point? I see, I see no one. And therefore, uh, let's ask for public comment. City Clerk. Thank you. If you are participating by telephone and you wish to speak, please press star nine now. When it's your turn to speak, you'll be notified that the host is inviting you to participate and you will need to press star six to unmute yourself. If you are participating on YouTube, please submit your comments now and note that when submitting comments on YouTube, you need to write public comment prior to your message if you would like it to be read into the record. As a reminder, we ask that you please speak slowly to allow for effective interpretation of, our, of your comments into Spanish. I'm gonna give it about 15 seconds. We, oh, I'm gonna let that continue. People are still entering into YouTube. Any public comments? There are. Okay. I'm still finishing submitting in YouTube. We also have a public comments that will require Spanish to English interpretation. Noemi, are you available at the moment? Okay, I'm gonna yes. go. Perfect, I will go ahead and ask to unmute. If you are participating on the Spanish interpretive line, Go ahead and press star six when you receive this notification.
So if you've received a notification that you that you will need to be unmuted, you will need to press star six. Okay, in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead. We have we have it. No, I mean you're muted. I am not getting any um, audio on this side. Well, if you no one's speaking. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. We do have a comment from Chris Hart. It's relative to Canal Alliance Working Group. I urge the council to not place nonprofit organizations into a first right of refusal position on sales of multifamily projects. There is a market-driven desire to support this objective and to help assist exec executing the desires of the Canal Alliance, ex excuse me, executing the desires of the Canal Alliance. This is Opportunity Zone and now the private, oh, it looks like, now the private market desires to get involved to provide economic solutions. The private sector can assist and wants to assist. Special provisions of a disincentive, thanks. And there are more comments that are coming in over YouTube now. And we'll just have to give those a moment to get submitted. Noemi, if you have a public comment, you're welcome to go ahead and provide that now. Yes, go Thank ahead. You. Adelante. Adelante, señora. Hello. My name is Cristina Rosales, and I wanted to comment with regards to the high rents in this area. And I don't know if uh, you're able to find a solution because rents are very expensive. Algo más, señora? And I also wanted to, to um, ask if uh, there could be an increase in the minimum wage uh, to at least, for it to at least go up to $15 an hour. Adelante. Algo más? And that is it. Thank you, Noemi. Mean. We have another public comment through YouTube. I support passage of the full proposal from the Canal Working Group. Yes to rent cap. First side of refusal and eviction moratorium to help mitigate the devastation of COVID-19 on our canal neighbors. Thank you. We should have another speaker on our Spanish audio line. Okay, no, I mean, was there a public comment on the line? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ms. Rosales asked um, if there's something else that she could add. From her prior comment? Yes. Yeah, yes. Señora Rosales, adelante. ¿Cuál era su otra petición? And, perdón? Puede hablar un poquito más alto. Oh, and so I wanted to ask if there's a way to um, approve a rent control law that would protect low income households. 
¿Algo más? And once again, if there could be an increase of the minimum wage to at least $15 an hour. ¿Algo más, señora? And that is it. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. And I'm going to move. This is from, okay, regarding Canal Alliance. I strongly support this resolution. We do need to emulate San Francisco's small sites program and give first right of refusal to nonprofit developers to create more affordable housing in the community. This has been very successful in San Francisco in preserving naturally occurring affordable housing and making it permanent. Another comment is, has San Francisco's results proven effective? Are there metrics to back this up? Doesn't seem like it from the outside. Can we get those now? This is another public comment. We definitely need more affordable housing for essential workers and residents of the canal. And finally, we do have a few public comments coming in from our Spanish audio line. So Noemi, we're going to be using you here in a moment. And if you receive a notification that you've been unmuted, please press star six. Adelante, la persona que pidió la, la palabra. Si escuchó ella el aviso, por favor, oprima estrella seis. I am not. Sí, adelante. Le escucho, sí. ¿Me escucha usted a mí? Good evening. My name is Veronica Duarte. Adelante, puede continuar hablando ininterrumpidamente. And I know that we sound like a broken record, but to tell you the truth, we really want our voice to be heard so that um, there will be for entire uh, Marine County and San Rafael some sort of rent control book because to tell you the truth, we do not have that. Algo más? And I also want to um, um, ask for help for, for local businesses, like uh, the most affected, which are restaurants, because they have had to cut back on, on staff. And so if there could be some sort of assistance for these small businesses, that would be great. Algo más, señora Duarte, o es todo? And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. We've got another caller on the line. If you receive a notification, please press star six. Noemi, you may be muted. Adelante, adelante. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marina Palma, and I want to thank you all for your service. Because we are right now um, covering a very, talking about a very important topic, which is um, canal policy, the canal policy working group. I am a canal volunteer with uh, the group called Canal Voices. And I'd like to share with you that very sadly, 
um, you know, um, it was necessary for us to uh, uh, get a pandemic to be able to realize how we can work um, together and for essential workers to be appreciated. But we have been essential workers since we arrived here in Marin. And, and this pandemic um, has us really stressed out because many of us uh, don't have money to pay our rent. There are people who are leasing a room are also being evicted by their landlords. And because of everything that's happening, um, um, you know, uh, children who were attending school here in Marion have also been displaced. And so we would like to ask you to please uh, give the right to nonprofit agencies um, to uh, give them a first refusal so that they can um, enable us to, um, those of us who already live in Canal, to remain here. And so I'd like to ask if you can also create a program um, or, or pa approve a law that will give us rent control. Uh, but uh, what's urgent right now is for us to be able to get rent assistance because we are way behind on rent, rent payments, and that is truly affecting everyone. And adults, you know, we may be able to endure it, but children cannot. And so we ask you to please create a program that um, will allow banks to give us a loan so that we can pay our our accumulated debt. And so any help that you can give us so that we can continue moving forward um, and uh, to to safeguard our families so that we may also continue as residents of this wonderful county. Um, and I, I really ask that you uh, uh, listen to this. And, and I also thank God for the opportunity for these meetings to open these doors for all of us to have these conversations together and so that we can continue um, being part of this county as well. And please take us into account, um, take this part of the community into account and whenever, uh, particularly when it comes to things that, that affect our community, I am very grateful with all of you. Thank you very much. And uh, Madam City Clerk, do we have many more comments? Because we're about at a break point. Uh, we do have two more comments. Okay, let's, excuse me, let's take the two and then we'll go to uh, a very short break. Thank you. If you've received a notification that you've been unmuted, please press star six now. Good evening. Uh, perdón, ¿cuál es su apellido? Cristina. Oh, this is Cristina Rosales again, and I would like to ask you all. If uh, you could make funds available so that the, there are um, extracurricular activities for our children and after and after school programs and uh, for our children thank you if you've received a notification go ahead and speak Adelante. I'd like to offer a public comment. Adelante. I'd like to know if it's allowed during the pandemic for landlords to give uh, rent increases at Canal because an acquaintance of mine has ha received a rent increase during this pandemic twice. And so her rent increase um, adds up to $250, which I believe is very unfair. So I wonder if, um, if she can get some sort of legal representation um, with someone who can inform her of uh, whether this is allowed 
whether what the landlord is doing to her is allowed. Um, so um, if someone if someone can give her some aid about information about what's happening in her apartment complex. Okay, one more comment and then uh, the request of the interpreter, we will go to a short break. And uh, Stephanie, maybe you could help us with the last question and I'll direct the others to uh, Christine uh, when we return. Mayor, if I may, there are still YouTube comments, so I'll take this last audio call and maybe when we return, I can return to the YouTube comments. That should be Thank great. you. So I've just asked someone to unmute, please press star six. Mm -hmm. Looks like they lowered their hand. So that concludes the public comment from the audio side. We still have about five public comments on YouTube. Uh, I can either read those now or now or right after the recess. We shall uh, take a short recess uh, uh, to respect the interpreter's request. So we'll do that. Uh, let's take a five, <coughs> excuse me a five minute break and we'll return for the additional comments and then. Uh, <clears throat> uh, several comments to address some of the concerns. Uh, I would encourage the, the speakers to, to keep in mind the agenda item they have before us. Some of these items are critical and they're quite important to many of us. <clears throat> However, they're not actually the agenda items per se. So let's keep our comments if we could to the agenda item. So with that, five minute break. Thanks everyone.
We're ready, Mr. Mayor. We took a short recess and we'll now resume uh, with um, item regarding canal policy working group public comments. I presume there are some additional comments. There are, thank you. So we had an add on from John Reynolds comments relating to um, affordable housing for essential workers and residents of the canal. And also he added to add parking options for residents. We have another comment. I support the adoption of the resolution. We have to support the essential workers who have kept the city of Centerfell on its feet during the pandemic. This is from the Centerfell Chamber of Commerce. We are proud to be support a supporting partner of this coalition. We understand the immense value that this community in East Centerfell plays in our city. We look forward to working with the steering committee to address these, to address these complicated issues. What about parking options for workers with trucks and vans for families in the canal? My name is Alex and I support the adoption of the resolution to support those most impacted by the pandemic through the canal policy working group solutions. Another comment. Sustainable Marin strongly supports the resolution put forward by the canal policy working group with thanks to Mayor Phillips, Vice Mayor Collin, City Council, and staff for their work and commitment to creating more and more fair and equitable opportunities in Center Falls Canal neighborhood. Another comment. I demand that you start walking your talk. That means both 501c3s and local government. Canal residents are forced to live in crowded housing because of lack of affordable housing. Then folks are shocked when COVID numbers are high and full of positive test results. How is that? How is it that we are allowing children who live in the same zip code to have different health outcomes? And that concludes public comment. And thank you everyone for, uh, for your comments. A couple of questions came up uh, during the course of public comment and I'll ask uh, Stephanie Legal Aid with Marin, if she would handle uh, the one issue briefly because it's a little off point, but it's important to, uh, to our community. So if you would, Stephanie, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, as, as far as the question, how to access legal services, um, Legal Aid of Marin provides housing legal services, information, um, advice, and representation on the issues that folks have discussed here, including is the rent increase okay, is including um, notices from landlords and those types of questions. Um, we are at the Canal Alliance's food distribution on Tuesday mornings from nine to 11. That is probably the easiest um, way to come without an appointment and just come by and speak with one of our attorneys. Um, we, uh, we can also be reached by telephone at 415-492-0230, extension 102 is our reception, and we will call you back, and we will be happy to assist. Our services are for low-income individuals and seniors living in the canal, or living in, in the, the county of Marin. Uh, Thank you, sorry. Stephanie. I have I have dealt with uh, Legal Aid of Marin on a couple of specific issues, and uh, your group is outstanding in, uh, in the service you provided to uh, those who were impacted. So thank you for that and the continued service. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask Christine to respond to the other questions, but certainly impressed by Dennis's and Omar's comments. So if you have uh, anything you'd like to add, feel uh, feel free to, to do so. But let's start with Christine with regard to several of the other issues that were presented. Sure. So um, the comments and concerns and requests of the public speakers, I've, I've taken pretty copious notes of everything that was that was shared in public comment on this item. And I'd suggest that we take all of those concerns and requests to the Canal Policy Working Group that meets on Friday morning at 930 and discuss as a group um, how we'll move forward. Some of those are already initiatives of the group. Some of them are not right within the scope of this group. But um, but we can work on on how to address those specific concerns 
Um, just to clarify and kind of bring us back to the to the staff recommendation for this item tonight, it is a staff's recommendation that the city council approve the resolution that's attached in your packet um, with some of the specific language that we've spoken to tonight. So um, if there are questions or Omar or Dennis or Stephanie or Chandra, if you have any other comments or points of clarification from public comment, I welcome your thoughts. Uh, Omar or Dennis, uh, unmute if you wish to make a comment. Uh... If not, uh, stay where you're at. Omar. Mr. Mayor, just to you know, um, highlight the sense of urgency that exists in the community. You heard tonight from the public comments, the, the, the impact is, is real, is deep, and is affecting our essential workers. Um, I hope that helped to, for the council to make a decision tonight and approve the resolution. Thank you, Omar, and we hold you in highest regard, so I know you'll address the issues brought before us. Uh, Kate, I know you've been involved in this. Do you have anything you'd like to add at this point? I just want to express my gratitude to Omar for his leadership and Chandra and Stephanie for being partners in, uh, in this work. And we recognize that the resolution is just the first part of a long conversation and lots of policies we hope to have fall out of it. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to Marin County um, and for their leadership as well. So it's government and community working together. And it, the pandemic has brought forward a lot of issues we've all known are there. And by working together, we're going to change the way it is and, and, and start to make um, some, put, implement some solutions. So uh, with that, I, if it's time, I would, I would uh, love to make a motion to approve the resolution if my colleagues don't have anything else to add. Uh, the motion accepted. We'll ask for a second and then uh, uh, ask for comment before the uh, vote is taken. So is there a second with regard to the motion? I'll second it. Second. Andrew McCullough has seconded. Any comment before we go to vote? I see none and oh, therefore, what, oh, I'm sorry, Andrew, please. Well, Mr. Mayor, I was just gonna say as an aside uh, that uh, ordinarily I might be tempted to want to edit some of the language because it's fairly sweeping in its nature, but the issue I think is far too important for me to quibble over the choice of words. So with that, I do endorse the resolution in front of us. And thank you for your comment. I'll ask for uh, I to, uh, Feel the principle stated in the, uh, the policy that's before us uh, is, is well presented with a number of concerns addressed and uh, look forward to further advancement on this issue. And Omar, I remember taking the, uh, or receiving rather the email from you a couple of months ago, and uh, I'm, I'm most pleased the way this is developing. So thank you on behalf of myself and, and I would suggest the council and the community. So thanks for doing so. With that, uh, I'll call for a uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Aye. Phillips. Aye, and that matter carries 5 0 to be continued. Thanks, everyone. We'll move on <coughs> to the next item is uh, CDG, uh, BG uh, Care Coronavirus Funding Allocation Recommendations. And that would be Christine. No. Uh, Ethan, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure who was going to present on behalf of the staff. Ethan, no, up. my screen share. Um, <laughs> I, I am just going to do a quick little presentation. Um, so, before the council tonight is a resolution recommending CDBG CARES Act coronavirus funding allocation recommendations. And I have Jillian Zeiger with the county with me as well, who can help answer some of these questions. Um, she, she's kind of our main person that would deal with CDBG for Mar Marin County. Um, so a little background, uh, this is uh, this funding is related to the CARES Act, which was approved in March 27, 2020, which uh, allocated about appropriated $5 billion to the CDBG program for COVID-19 relief. Since it was appropriated in fiscal year 1920, you may see language in both the resolution and in the staff report where we refer back to fiscal year 1920. We know that we're in fiscal year 2021, but since it's a supplemental funding program, to fiscal year 1920, that's why there's that OOL reference. Um, you may also hear us refer to uh, CARES CDBGCV funds. Um, the federal government likes to throw a lot of acronyms, but that, that, that is um, how we, we've been referring to the CDBGCV funds. So uh, uh, in May 4th, we brought the initial CDBGCV funding allocation to council. 
And the recommendation that was made was that for the entire county allocation, which was $938,000, that all that money um, be directed to rent subsistence payments for residents at risk of homelessness due to COVID-19. The current funding allocation is referred to as CDBGCV Allocation 3A. And this was a significantly uh, more allocation of about $1.8 million, $1.79 to be exact. Um, why it was a big increase is that HUD, um, as part of their directive for this funding, wanted to target communities with households most at risk for transmission and risk of eviction with higher amounts for states with high rates of coronavirus. So using that directive, uh, county staff re-looked at how we allocated these CDBGCV funds and developed a new methodology that emphasized a focused needs assessment in areas with the highest rates of COVID-19 in the areas facing higher risk of eviction. And because of that, the recommended CDBGCV allocation by planning area San Rafael received about a 52% share of this at about $943,000. Nevada was second with a 27% share, and then the county other came in about 20%. The staff's recommend, um, funding recommendation is to split the share for 75% to go to those rental assistance subsistence payments, but also allocate 25% for assistance with small and micro business enterprises. And that was what Christine was referring to um, in the last agenda item. The options for city council would be to adopt the resolution, adopt the resolution with modifications, to direct staff to return with more information, and finally take no action. And with that, I'll open it up um, if you guys have any questions. Any questions of uh, of staff, <clears throat> Mr. Guy? Um, I see none at this point, and therefore we shall turn to public comment. Anyone from the public? Thank you. If you are participating by telephone and you wish to speak, please press star nine. When it's your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate, and you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. If you're participating on YouTube, please submit your comments now and note that when submitting comments on YouTube, you need to write public comment prior to your message if you would like it to be read into the record. As a reminder, we ask that you please speak slowly to allow for effective interpretation of your comments. I'm gonna give it about 15 seconds. I see no calls right now. Noemi, it looks like we do have a couple of phone calls on our on your line. I'm going to go ahead and have and ask to unmute now. If you receive this notification, please press star six. Good evening. Can you hear me? Le escuchamos. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cecilia Gramajo, and I belong to uh, San Rafael's Parish, and I'm uh, and I'm a member of M MOC, and I'm here to show my support um, to the uh, CDBG uh, proposal. I live in the Canal area, and as many as my neighbors, my family has lost income during this shelter in place. MOC is continuing to work to strengthen the uh, tenant protections available, particularly during uh, this crisis created by the pandemic. And we hope that you approve these new um, uh, rental assistance funds and for uh, uh, you all to continue working together with o MOC so that we uh, may uh, be able to provide protections to tenants and to um, give tenants uh, every, every protection possible. And we hope that this is approved because rents are very expensive and there are no jobs right now. And in, in the existing jobs, uh, sometimes people don't want to pay even the minimum. And so that's not enough for people to pay for uh, their um, their rents up 
uh, their their rent, and um, and this is uh, even more difficult during the pandemic. And um, and hopefully you can also support us so that we won't be getting any more rent rent increases uh, increases. And thank you for listening. If you received a notification to unmute, please press star six. Good evening. My once again, my name is Marina Palma, and. And I would like to uh, thank you all for the assistance you have provided. Um, but since the pandemic continues, I, and to tell you the truth, um, there's really no way right now to support our families. And because of that, we, we ask that you approve um, the funds for this program so that we can um, stabilize ourselves and, uh, uh, again and, and to also give our families a little bit of, of hope and so that we may continue living in Marin and County and also con um, continuing uh, holding our jobs here. So um, I do hope that you approve this. Um, assistance, particularly now through the pandemic. Thank you. From Centerfield Chamber of Commerce, we are supportive of this allocation of CDBG funds to support the business community that has been hit so hard. We are grateful for the portion to help our local businesses and their families. That can, oh, there's one more public comment. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. For the record, my name is Peter Mendoza and I'm the director of advocacy at the Marin Center for Independent Living and I'm Marin Center for Independent Living is also a member of the Marin Organizing Committee. And I'm just speaking, uh, coming here tonight to speak to you in support of these funds, COVID-19 has hit people with disabilities and older adults and marginalized communities. Uh, and I want to point out that disability crosses many communities and it's hit our communities very hard. So in brief, this support will allow people that are already having a difficult time be able to uh, remain <coughs> housed in their communities. Thank you very much. That, that concludes the public comments portion of the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for, for commenting on the, uh, the staff report and Ethan, uh, thank you again for a complete report, uh, nicely done uh, with the recommendation you've, you've proposed. So thank you. Thank you for that. With that, uh, I'll ask for comment from council members and then we'll go to vote. Anyone? Uh, I have a quick comment. Pushy, please. Um, and and I'd uh, be delighted to um, segue into a, a nice um, motion as well. Um, I My comment is that I, I was very pleased to see that the allocation had been revised um, to better reflect the location of the um, individuals in need of this assistance. Um, so um, I think it was a, um, uh, a very for forthright thing to do to um, change those numbers around to um, get a much larger allocation to the community that needs it, which happens to be located in San Rafael. So with that comment, I'm happy to um, move that we adopt the resolution as presented. I'll accept that as a uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Vote and second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Aye, and that matter carries 5-0, and thanks everyone for participating. We'll now move to the Opportunity Zone Renter Relocation Assistance Informational Report. Um, Ethan, is that, is, I believe this is you. <laughs> You're up again. Thank you. 
Ethan, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. All right. I have the presentations to keep me straight tonight. So uh, th this, this presentation is on the Opportunity Zone Renter Relocation Assistance Informational Report. Um, so just a little bit of background. Uh, the Opportunity Zone itself was created as part of the U.S. Investing Opportunities Act in 2017. Uh, the Opportunity Zone provides a tax incentive for investing capital gains through what's known as an opportunity fund. The longer an investor keeps their money in the opportunity fund investment, the larger the tax break they will receive. So in order to, to get an opportunity fund, you have to invest it through this opportunity fund. Opportunity zone funding through an opportunity zone fund. Now, one thing to clarify is that since this was federal legislation, um, there's no provisions in the legislation for undesignating a qualified opportunity zone. So some of the background, again, how we got here tonight. On October 5th, we had a study session where staff provided an overview of the opportunity zone, um, of the current rental market conditions, and potential changes to rental relocation assistance payment. Based upon that study session, staff was directed to prioritize work on potential renter relocation assistance for renters within the opportunity zone. The next step would include staff returning with an informational report, and it's why we're here tonight. So uh, one of the questions that came up during the study session is what are these, what are the impacted properties from the opportunity zone? So part of our analysis is we look through all the properties themselves. We had about 35 single family homes, 10 condominium buildings, 82 apartment buildings and 13 non-residential buildings. Now of that 35 single family homes equaled 35 units. The condominiums had about 254 units but the significant one was the apartment buildings, which came in at about 130, sorry, 1,387 properties, or sorry, units. Ethan, now, no. sorry, Ethan, can I have you slow down a little bit for our interpreter? Thank you very much. So of those apartment buildings, 139 units have been deed restricted below market rate protections. And why that's important is that's attached to the property. So as through the opportunity zone, because the opportunity zone to get those tax incentives requires a substantial rehab, those deed restrictions would maintain even on an opportunity zone project. So currently, we have a citywide renter relocation assistant requirement, assistance requirement. This applies only to no-fault evictions, which includes situations where an owner moves in, situations where there's a substantial rehab, which means 50% of the property's value gets put into rehabbing the property. So if you have a million-dollar property, you have to put in at least a half million dollars to trigger a substantial rehab. And then finally, if you're going to demolish the property, these are all considered no fault evictions. In order to qualify for the current citywide renter relocation assistance, the household must also be low income. We did not explicitly state that in the study session, so I just wanted to make sure that I clarified that tonight. And then finally, the payment itself, which would be made by the property owner to the displaced household, would be equal to two times the least rent. So that is the, the, the amount that is paid per month as written on the lease between the household and the, the property owner. What we're proposing tonight in the staff report are proposed changes only to the renter relocation assistance for the opportunity zone itself. So it's mainly split up into three main sections. There's a base relocation payment, which would apply to all displaced rent renters in the opportunity zone for no fault eviction. And that would include a first month's rent payment, a security deposit payment equal to two times the rent and estimated moving expenses. There's also a supplemental relocation payment, which would include a temporary per diem of $150 a night, 
which would reflect the what the cost it would be if a renter was displaced midway through a, uh, a, a month. So let's say your lease goes from the first of the month to the end of the month, and you're displaced halfway through on the 15th day, you would get a per diem until the next month. And then finally, there's supplemental relocation payments equal to the housing characteristics. It would be a one household, uh, it would be one payment if a household meets one of three criteria, either a household with a child, a household with an individual 65 years or older, and a household with individuals with disability. Now, some of the, the additional piece too would be a payment to the city of San Rafael per unit. This would be an administrative fee that is meant to cover implementation costs provided by a third party. Now, the reason why it increases from 10% for one to 10 units, 15% from 11 to 20 units, and 20% for 21 plus units is because of the increased difficulty of finding additional housing for displaced households for 10 units versus 20 units versus 21 plus. It's harder to find more units when you have that many people going onto the market. So some of the key changes from the citywide versus the, the, the proposed is that these proposed would only apply to the opportunity zone. There would not be any income restrictions. So all households would qualify if they have a no fault eviction. The payments would also be based on the higher between the least rent versus the HUD fair market rent. And this is important because oftentimes the lease rent is below market rate. So the fair market rent is a number that's put out annually by the federal, uh, federal HUD, which would be, uh, reflects the cost of, of the market rent in a jurisdiction for the previous year. So each year this comes out and it's indexed and it's a number that we have annually. And it's often much bigger than what the lease rent is. Additionally, one of the main changes is that there's an increased base relocation payment. It's not the two months, it's the three months and the moving expenses. There's also that included supplemental relocation payments, which were the, the temporary housing per diem, and then those uh, that one-time supplemental relocation for a qualified household. And then finally, there would be an administrative fee that I, that I discussed. So the options tonight would be to accept the report, to direct staff to return with more information, or to take no action. Since this is an informational report, we've provided a draft ordinance, but you're not voting on the draft ordinance tonight. It, it's for reference to, to provide some guidance as to kind of how we'd see these potential changes be made. And with that, um, I'll kick it back for any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, by further introduction, I, I think most of you are aware uh, that I, I've had uh, some concern about this topic for quite some time now. Uh, and it's not uh, absolutely theoretical since I did meet with two different groups uh, that were within the Opportunity Zone. Uh, Walnut Creek Investor came in and, and acquired those units. And the typical business format is to either tear the place down or substantially improve uh, the property as per requirement of the, uh, of the income, federal income tax measure to either uh, defer or avoid capital gains tax. Uh, and the consequence of, of this business structure, and we've talked about this before, so I'll make it brief, but the consequence as I see it is uh, pretty detrimental to, uh, potentially detrimental to many within our community, particularly, uh, well, exclusively within the opportunity zone, because the business plan is to come in, kick everybody out. Uh, and in fact, we were faced with, before Legal Aid and Marin came in, faced with eviction notices two weeks after the properties were acquired. So the business plan is kick everybody out, put a lot of money into the property, which is a good thing in many ways, but it also uh, increases the, the uh, fair market rent because of the investment. And uh, if those individuals were coming back to the uh, units where they previously lived, uh, more than likely in cases, the two cases I met, everyone uh, was not able to uh, afford the units uh, that they previously lived in because of the, uh, the tax structure, I would suggest that encourages a substantial increase in rents. So uh, 
if you if you look at and many of you have I know look at uh, some of the writings with regard to opportunity zones. Uh, while it may sound very attractive and and quite frankly put in with the uh, the Trump administration support uh, because it greatly in, uh, enhances uh, the investors' uh, capital gains tax. That is a uh, without going into all the details, but it uh, potentially you can defer the capital gains that you invest in the property. And after a 10 year period, the capital gains on your investment uh, is not subject to tax. And that's why there's an incentive built into substantially increased rents because that's how fair market value of uh, rental units be the apartment or, or, or um, well, I'll say apartments to generalize. Um, that is where the increase comes from and you avoid, if you keep it for a 10 year period, uh, any capital gains tax, uh, which sounds good, but also you'll hear, and I've, you know, I've just read a few articles, maybe you did too. Biggest problem with opportunity zones, it goes on and on and talks about uh, primarily gentrification, which I think is going to be the outcome if we don't recognize at this point in time, uh, that is a possible consequence and deal with it as Ethan has and the staff have suggested and I would go one step further I'm not going to bring it up at this point in time but I also think there there should be a another um, modification after we see how this goes within the opportunity zone maybe spread to uh, beyond the opportunity zone <clears throat> and then also the time frame uh, that we're looking at but that's not before us this evening so I'm not going to get into any detail on that uh, <clears throat> Opportunity zones are just an opportunity for the rich to gentrify poor neighborhoods. Uh, publication, <clears throat> a lot of these are from, well, this is, <clears throat> pardon me, Urban uh, Disparity, Bloomberg, et cetera. Potential flaws in opportunity zones do risk of large scale tax avoidance. Trump administration said these tax breaks would help distress neighborhoods. Who's actually benefiting? Federal opportunities <clears throat> zone programs and its implication to communities talks about some of the consequences, uh, so-called opportunity zone, provide opportunities for whom. So there's quite a bit of, it's been recently written on this <clears throat> law that, that was put in place <clears throat> in uh, 2019. There are approximately, oh, slightly over 8,000 opportunity zones throughout the country. And I think it, uh, it frankly, it's gonna put us ahead of uh, most of those because a lot of them are scratching their heads to what to do with kind of the consequences and this, uh, I feel pretty strongly, quite frankly, is an important step uh, <clears throat> to take now rather than to wait until the next one comes down the pike. And I can, I can promise you uh, for what it's worth, but I can promise you that it's going to, to happen because in talking with the attorney of representing the Walnut Creek investors, uh, San Rafael is, uh, is prime for opportunity investment uh, because of its location, because, I mean, he said, and and uh, I'd like to think it's true, uh, the city is well run, uh, proximity to San Francisco, et cetera. So uh, my crystal ball tells me this is a real deal for San Rafael. And uh, the steps that Ethan has outlined, I think are an important first step. I don't consider them to be final steps, but an important first step uh, to recognize the issue before us. So that's, those are my comments. Uh, certainly welcome other comments before we go to the public, including Council Member Gamblin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ethan, in, in the research that you've done on the Opportunity Zone program, because it's been out for a couple of years, and there's been a number of cities that have actually, you know, embraced it. Um, um, what have you What have you found out about some of the concerns that the mayor pointed out in regards to gentrification of the, the areas of people getting displaced and, and rents, you know, significantly increasing? Um, I would I would imagine by now um, that there's been a number of projects that have gone through throughout the United States that we have some sort of um, documentation on on what's happening in reality rather than just assuming that this this is going to happen here in San Rafael because it's a possibility. So well, I'll I'll interrupt by saying it's happened twice because I met with the uh, not only the, the resident a number of residents that were impacted by this but also in the second meeting uh, with the superintendent of schools, school board member, and about six kids that uh, were faced in relocating from the schools that they were, uh, they were attending. So <clears throat> I'd be interested in Ethan's comments, but believe me, it's, it's a real deal with regard to San Rafael. 
Yeah, no, and it, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I think the, 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 the hardest part about it is that um, the legislation that created the opportunity zones did not require any local reporting requirements. So it's very difficult to know or be able to trace a cause and effect between an opportunity zone um, project and um, a specific displacement or rent control, right? Or I'm um, not rent control, but rent increases. Um, just because uh, there isn't that reporting requirement, we can't say this one project led to, led to this. The other piece that's difficult about it is that the, the factors that led to the designation of opportunity zones are the exact same factors that um, uh, organizations like the, um, the Turner Center at UC Berkeley have flagged as being um, factors for putting properties and locations at risk of displacement and gentrification. So it, 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 part of the, the issue is that these are um, neighborhoods and census tracts that are already experiencing these market forces and are already far along in terms of gentrification and displacement. So this kind of adds some fuel to that fire. Um, so the specific amount in that, um, uh, how much rent increase is going on in an opportunity zone, as of right now, I haven't been able to find specific um, studies that, that, that try to track that amount. Um, no, I would just, I would just think, no, sorry to interrupt, I would just think that if, if this was potentially widespread, that this was happening, because all of these, all of these designated opportunity zones have one thing in common, they're, they're typically not you know, in, in areas that are already developed in, and affluent. They are in areas that are typically either underdeveloped, um, have gone through um, a time where they have lost development there, and they're trying to bring back into investment into these areas to basically bring them back to uh, a certain area. Um, so I would imagine that there would probably, if, there, if these things were happening, that we would hear about them. I, I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that that I haven't heard about these things in, in specific to opportunity zones in the research that I've done. Um, but aside from that, the, then my next question is in regards to the uh, rental assistance um, that we're providing, and we're we're changing that from whatever the current lease is to whatever the higher of the current lease versus the current HUD rent for that, you said what district. So what district is that being calculated for? Is that Marin, Marin in general? Is that San Rafael? How is the one bedroom that you have in the staff report being calculated? That, that, that is the county of Marin. So th th there's a number that, that we use for the county of Marin. Um, and uh, it's most often used for um, section eight vouchers. So uh, with section eight, how that works is that the, the, the tenant pays 30% of the right. rent bump, the difference is made. So it's the same number that would be used essentially for the Section 8 or other federally voucher pro, federal voucher programs. Right. So so what, I mean, just to, as an example, I think on your, your report, you said for a one-bedroom apartment, that number would be $2,700 a month. And how much is a one-bedroom in the Opportunity Zone going for right now? So I generally, when I, when I was pulling up the, the census data, I was seeing about 1500 a month. Um, but that's an average. Um, that's the most recent information. Um, that's going to be pretty wide. Um, it really is going to be dependent upon the, the quality of the household too. So uh, a, a, a household that may have um, some major structural issues or some code issues may, may be cheaper. It's, it's, it's often um, determined as a naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing in this census tract. Um, so I, I would not be surprised, and this is just a rough estimate, if, if the, the fair market rent is maybe one and a half to two times larger than what that lease rent would be. And, and when, when people, when developers are doing their pro forma, for potentially buying a property, redeveloping it, and then putting it back on the housing market, are they anticipating getting the full market rent of what is the average of Marin County for that location? Or would you know would 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 someone who took an apartment that was charging currently fifteen hundred dollars a month in that location would they be able to turn around and charge twenty seven hundred dollars a month for that same apartment after they redid that? Is that is that what we're anticipating? 
So it, it's, a, it's a great question. And usually what, what's included in the pro forma for a developer is not actually the, mar the fair market rent. It's above the fair market rent. Um, the fair market rent is discounted some by HUD to reflect the fact that this is existing stock. Um, and it may not necessarily be a brand new unit. Um, so what a, what a developer would likely include would be comps directly from similar projects that are, that are new construction. So HUD fair market rent is not considered new construction. It considers the existing stock. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mary, you're muted. Muted off. Sorry. Uh, I'm looking for others that wish to make comment. Councilmember Bushy. Sorry. Uh, just some some questions. So Ethan, just so I understand it, in the current world. Um, throughout San Rafael, um, if a low-income tenant is evicted, that is um, ordered to move out, um, other than at the end of a lease term or uh, in, in some other um, legally permissible time, that this low-income tenant would be entitled to two months' rent in cash compensation. Is that right? Um, the, the clarification I would want to make is that it's only for no fault evictions. And, that, and it's a really important decision. Um, and, and I know that Nira is on the line as well. And she, she's very good at kind of um, parsing out exactly what, what that legal distinction is. And then the other piece that I would say, and it's also the least rent. So it, um, that least rent may be lower than um, what the actual rent would be. It's right. So, but my, my point is that if we do nothing, um, or a, a better way is, as we sit here today, all of the low-income renters in the Opportunity Zone are guaranteed on two months' rent if the, the owner of the building um, directs that they be, move out of the building, correct? Uh, assuming that there is not a, um, I'm going to get lost in my double negatives, a, a non-no-fault eviction before the no-fault eviction. And there are some administrative, yeah, yeah. Um, there are there are there are a few um, uh, administrative legal um, things that need to happen as part of our Title 14 requirements, a part of our current rental restriction requirements. But generally, yes, what you're saying is accurate. Okay, so that exists today. All right, so that's one area that I, I wanted to confirm. I, now I want to switch to um, the um, propose your proposal and what it would um, apply to. I understand that it would apply to all no-fault no evictions in the opportunity zone, whether or not they were related to an investment scheme as the, as the mayor has outlined. Is that right? Yes. And I'm going to kick it to Nira to make sure that I said that accurately. <laughs> yes, that's right. It, it, it was exactly as you said it, Councilmember Bushy. Okay, so it applies, it, it's going to uh, apply to everyone. Okay, and so, um, okay, and now looking at the other broad applicability, um, you've expanded from low income um, uh, tenants to um, all tenants. What What is the rationale behind that? So the main one is for, it's for the household and not the tenant. So the, the payment is made at the household level. Um, the main rationale is that um, all tenants, regardless of their income levels, would be impacted equally um, by uh, a no-fault eviction related to an opportunity zone no-fault eviction. Okay, so a millionaire living in a penthouse with a view of the canal would get would be would also um, receive this benefit. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, last thing, and, and, and maybe Nearest but could um, help me with this. This will do nothing. Well, what effect would this proposal have if the owner of the building simply waited till the end of the lease term um, and, and indicated they no longer wish to lease the property? Would the tenants receive any compensation at all? Under 1480, AB 1482, they would still receive the one month relocation assistance. Um, and under this ordinance, as proposed, they would receive the benefits that Ethan is proposing. Oh, so it's not actually an eviction. This is if a 
a t a landlord wishes to stop providing um stop uh, to end the landlord tenant relationship even if it's at the end of the lease oh sorry no not if it's a, at the termination of the lease i'm sorry oh. i misunderstood once yeah, a lease that's is that terminated if there's no right to renew then the ordinance would kick in for eviction purposes I'm sorry, you lost me. You lost me if with the, the ordinance. Will kick. If I'm sorry, if the if the lease term ends and there's no right to renew the lease, then no, the benefits would not apply. Perfect. That's what I was like. Thank you. I'm sorry. My 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 apologies for misunderstanding. Thank you. Well, um, <clears throat> other uh, other comments before public. Uh, John. Yeah, just just one more, and it, it, it's probably been answered. And I, I was just a little bit confused on the on the report, Ethan. Just just for clarification: when the, the rental payment is made, the assistance payment is made. Let's just say for the one bedroom, the twenty seven hundred dollars or, or whatever that is. If there are three people in that one bedroom place, it's twenty seven hundred dollars per unit, or is it twenty seven hundred dollars per person that are on that lease? So if the lease is with three people and they all sign on that lease. Um, is it per person? So a one bedroom could get $7,500 or whatever, you know, cost, cost that, or is it per unit? It, it, it's per unit or per household. Yeah. So it's not individual per person. Okay. So it doesn't matter how many people have actually are obligated to the lease on a, on a lease agreement. It's, it's per the unit. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a one bedroom unit, it's this two bedroom, this, you know, they could, they could have two or three people in there, but it's the, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Let's go to let's go to uh, public <clears throat> comment. If you are participating by telephone and you wish to speak, please press star nine. When it's your turn to speak, you will be notified. The host is inviting you to participate, and you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. If you are participating on YouTube, please submit your comments now. And please note that when submitting comments on YouTube, you need to write public comment prior to your message if you would like it to be read into the record. As a reminder, we ask that you please speak slowly to allow for effective interpretation of your comments into Spanish. We do have a comment, Noemi, on your end. I just asked someone to unmute, so go ahead and press star six. Yes. Adelante. Disculpe, no le escucho. Adelante. Estrella seis, por favor. Um, there's no one on the line at this time. De nuevo, si usted ya fue invitada o invitado a dar su comentario, por favor, oprima estrella 6. Noemi, I see no one on your line, so I'm going to go ahead and move to public comments on YouTube if you'll mute yourself. Okay, so we have one comment from John Reynolds. Opportunity zones or opportunities for corporation developers. Another comment. Chris Hart, this is a good write-up. The Opportunity Zone provides a good avenue to deploy capital into the canal with the idea of maintaining the people and character of the canal. Mayor Phillips is correct, but more positive can come from this. Keep in mind that this is also a sea level rise area, so costs will be higher, but this can be done. Noemi, I'm hopping back over to your line. I see another commenter. Please press star six when you hear the notification. Adelante, si tiene comentario. Adelante. Sí, le escucho. Le escucho. My name is Marina Palma, 
and I am very happy with regards to this um, ordinance because it would protect tenants. But I do have some concerns about it. Here in Marin County, when you when you uh, live in Marin County and you have an accent and you have children, it's very difficult for you to find or to rent a home. And additionally, when landlords uh, try to um, um, evict you, they uh, should give you notification about three months ahead. Um, and they're supposed to, they they're supposed to pay you uh, for uh, or compensate you with two months rent, but I wanted to say that as uh, some people mentioned already, that when when landlords rehabilitate buildings, I wonder if there's a way to control uh, the subsequent rents because some people do want to come back and and live in that community again, and and I I wanted to say that. Um, that there isn't, um, uh, there isn't, uh, me permite, I'm sorry, señora Palma, señora Palma, me permite tantito ir un poquito más lento, por favor, para no perder nada. And I just wanted to say that, um, wages earned in Tiburón as opposed to San Rafael and other cities is, is not the same. So, um, it will be difficult for people uh, who work in one area and live in another area to be able to um, pay uh, the rents. Adelante. And for example, so let's say that a one bedroom uh, may cost fifteen hundred, but but uh, in Canal. Uh, a one bedroom may be two thousand to twenty three hundred, but because uh, many of us um, earn minimum uh, minimum wage or sometimes even less than minimum wage, um, that uh, basically results in many of us having to share one rent. And once again, I want to thank you for. Um, what you're trying to do on behalf of tenants, but I, I did want to share these concerns and make you aware of them so that you may uh, make it so that you may continue to make it possible for uh, those of us um, who are low income may continue to live here. Thank you very much. That concludes public comments for this agenda item. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your comments and, <clears throat> and input with regard to this item. Uh, concluding uh, comments, and then we'll go to a motion. Um, looking sorry. around, Vice Mayor Collin. Yeah, I just have, I have one comment. Uh, I appreciate the, the next step in this discussion. As the mayor said, this is something that uh, the council has been talking about for a while, and we do need to take action on. Just for the future, I would be interested in, I, I'm fine with have, just looking at the opportunity zone, but actually looking at some of these protections for um, broader than just the census track. So I think in the in the near term, let's get, let's get this going, but I would want to keep that possibility open in the future. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I think... Uh... My concluding comments, I think uh, Vice Mayor Collin is right. I see this as developing. It's not perfect, quite frankly. I sent uh, Jim an email at 3.14 in the morning uh, suggesting one additional step, but I don't want to bring it up this evening, but I think it would improve it. And quite frankly, it would uh, allow tenants to return to their unit once uh, renovation had taken place at the previous uh, rent that they were paying for a year I would suggest a year uh, so that they can, uh, if necessary, relocate uh, within that time frame. My principal reason for saying so, again, it's not part of this evening's, but down the road, just to give you a heads up, <clears throat> one of my concerns was the children that are involved and the disruption. Uh, if they are evicted uh, mid-year, uh, mid-school year, uh, that doesn't seem right to me. Uh, and I think we should do better than that. And part of that would be uh, an extension of the lease under the previous agreement for a period of time within the uh, within the opportunity zone. Uh, the tax benefits are substantial. I mean, they really are. And uh, I think that uh, it should go hand in hand that there wouldn't be a displacement, particularly with the eye 
towards the uh, the kids. That's the thing that bothers me the most. So that's down the road. That's not on this evening's uh, agenda. Um, I think it'll be further refined as we go along, but I agree with the vice mayor that this is a, I think an important first step to get us to a better place to avoid some of the consequences we've already faced, uh, quite frankly. So with that- Mayor, um, can so I add one thing from a- oh, Yes, please. I just wanna confirm with Ethan that uh, the immediate next step is to bring this to the planning commission on November 17th and get their input. Right. And then we would be able to, with that input, we'd be able to come back to the city council with the first reading of the ordinance for your consideration. And I think what we're hearing tonight is that there could be, there's many opportunities for kind of future phases of this or potential expansions that we could look at down the road. And it's also possible that there's something that comes out of the canal policy working group that you heard from earlier today that relates to expansion as well. So uh, we'll we'll keep on working on that, but we'll move uh, this particular recommendation, this draft ordinance onto the planning commission if the council supports it tonight. Yeah, thanks for thanks for mentioning because we'll go to planning commission uh, assuming we pass. And um, yeah, there are there are other additional consequences, but uh, I want to get out. Frankly, I think we do. I certainly do want to get out ahead of the potential of this issue. That so before it's uh, upon us, and uh, and then then what happens uh, beyond the eviction and the kids are getting displaced. So in any case, with that with that comment, I'll ask for a motion with regard to this item. And I see. I, I move approval. Uh, uh, moved and is there a second to the motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I be clear? The yes. motion is to accept the report. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you for the clarification. That's okay. correct. In that case, I would be happy to second it. Okay. And uh, it will go to planning and back to us at a later later date. Um, with that, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Your thoughts. Aye. The matter carries 5-0, and I must say I'm I'm delighted with the first step. Anyway, moving on then to affordable housing trust fund allocation. Um, let me call for a timeout for just a second. We have two remaining items. Uh, I'll call for a five-minute uh, recess, and then we'll return for items D and E, and conclude shortly thereafter. Thank you. Sorry, Andrew.
you, Mayor. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll conclude our short break and uh, continue under item D, Affordable Housing Trust Fund Allocation. Andrew Henning, I think that's yours. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. It's great to see you tonight. I believe uh, Ethan is pulling up our slides. We're gonna tag team this. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that Lily Thomas, the affordable housing manager for the County of Marin is on the call and she's happy to uh, answer any questions that might come up. And then um, they're not part of the panelists tonight, but um, Mary Kay Sweeney and Paul Fordham from Homeward Bound are also uh, joined for the meeting if there are other questions as well. So um, Ethan, if you wanna to go to my slide, I'll just give some brief context for this item. Um, I did wanna let the, the council knows, but just for the public as well, on September 21st, I gave a more detailed overview of our homelessness efforts in the county over the past five years. So I think that was like a 15 or 20 minute presentation and then we had a Q and A. So if there are more questions about this, you can find more information uh, online at that meeting. Um, but generally, um, just to kind of set up this home key item, um, I just wanted to convey again that over the past five years, we've really transformed our homeless system of care in Marin County. Uh, we've um, really begin to, begun to focus on the most vulnerable members of our homeless community, people that are chronically homeless, who are long-term homeless, who have uh, complex medical and behavioral health needs. Uh, and we've had a lot of success housing those folks. Over the last three years specifically, We've housed nearly 300 of the most vulnerable long-term homeless people in our community. And we've also joined a national movement called Built for Zero, uh, which is over 80 communities across the country that are using the same methodology that we're using of uh, really focusing on long-term homelessness, veterans homelessness, and trying to use data to measurably drive reductions in homelessness. Um, what we've seen specifically in San Rafael is that for the people that we've housed, over 90% of those people are still housed. And then in terms of kind of a before and after of EMS utilization, as well as police utilization, uh, we've seen a 50% reduction in, in, in EMS transports, and we've seen an over 80% reduction in um, police calls for service for folks that uh, had been homeless and then once they were housed through our efforts. And then the last thing I wanted to say just before turning it over to Ethan is that you know, over this whole five-year period, we've really been striving for uh, geographic equity in terms of where we're housing people. Um, the majority of the housing placements that have occurred over the past five years have happened outside of San Rafael. Um, I, I, asked, I verified this uh, empirically with the housing authority. Um, so a lot of the folks that have been getting help have been in San Rafael, and, and yet they're getting housed from Mill Valley to Novato to Larkspur to Inverness. So um, just to you know, acknowledge for the public and for the council, Project Home Key, which Ethan will describe, has happened infinitely faster than anyone would have asked for or hoped for. Uh, and there are reasons for that um, that are at the state level that are driving that, that timeline. But um, you know, I think some of the comments that have, have been said is, you know, is there a strategy? What is the strategy for homelessness in Marin? And I think as this council knows, we've been working very hard to develop a highly effective strategy that's gotten a lot of people housed. And even though this has happened faster and put us in kind of a faster decision process than we would like, um, it's really a chance for us to accelerate progress that's already happening. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ethan um, to describe more details about the opportunity. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, the item before the city council tonight specifically is a resolution approving a housing trust fund grant to the County of Marin for the affordable housing development at 3301 Kerner Boulevard in an amount not to exceed 1.54 million in authorizing the city manager to execute grant documents and related documents. So how this comes about, as Andrew mentioned, was because of Project Home Key. And Project Home Key is a $6 million program issued as part of the HCD Project Home Key program. Uh, specifically, that includes $550 million from the Corona Relief Funds and $50 million from the State General Fund. Now, part of the reason why there is such an extreme timeline on these funds is that the Corona Relief Funds must be expended by the end of the year. They don't exist after, after uh, the end of the year. So we have to spend this money as fast as possible. 
The funding was designated for local public agencies to purchase motels and other housing types in order, um, in order to build capacity to respond to homelessness and the current COVID-19 pandemic. As part of the project home key application that was submitted by the County of Marin, there were three projects. There was a 19 unit project with the America's Best Value in Corte Madera. There was a 70 unit project at in Marin in Novato and this current 44 unit project at 3301 Kerner. The project itself is applying for trust fund funding as part of a rolling application process, which was outlined in the trust fund guidelines. The rolling application process was designed specifically for a project like this, where we need to spend fund money fast if we want the project to move forward. The project itself is a collaboration between the County of Marin, Eden Housing, and Homeward Bound of Marin. There currently is going to be no more than 45 temporary units while the 190 Mill Street 2.0 project is being completed. And then the project itself would move over into a conversion to 44 new permanent supportive housing units. And what's important about that too, is that since they are new units, it would provide the city with much needed RENA credit. The project itself would cost about $23.4 million, the acquisition of which would come in part from $5.9 million coming from home key funding. That funding itself is contingent on local funding and that funding would come from this trust fund request of $1.54 million. That comes out to about $35,000 per unit. The development and services portion of the project itself, which is mostly the, the conversion to the 44 new permanent supportive housing units, that would come from tax credits and other funding sources. And part of, uh, one thing I just wanna stop there is part of the, the, the in lieu fee discussion that we had a few weeks ago, I, I threw out some ratios and I just want to show how those ratios relate to this specific request. For the acquisition alone, if, if we move forward with a trust fund request, we would be leveraging our trust fund dollars four to one. For the development itself, we would be leveraging our trust fund dollars at a ratio of 14 to one. The, the highest that we've seen in, in the United States for trust fund funding is a 16 to one ratio. So when, when, you, when you hear staff say this is somewhat unheard of, this is very unheard of to have money like this, this come around. Now, in terms of the fiscal impact, the current trust fund balance is about $3.5 million. Now, while we have 3.5 in the trust fund balance, only $2 million is currently available. And that's because um, at, at a previous city council meeting, we allocated about $1.55 um, million dollars, um, for uh, 190 Mill Street and the Whistle Stop projects, but those funds have not yet been appropriated. Um, additionally, we also received our first installment of the Lock Loman BMR buyout, and we received that in September. So that was $1.8 million. The funding request itself is for $1.54 million, which would be provided as a grant. Funds would have to go directly to escrow given this extreme home key funding deadline. And then finally, once that funding request is, if it's approved, that reduced the available fund balance to $485,960. However, we're also going to be receiving the second installment, that second final installment from the Lock Loman BMR buyout by March 31st, 2021. And that would be another $1.8 million. So the options currently before city council tonight are to adopt the resolution uh, approving the grant, adopt the resolution with modifications, direct staff to return with more information, or take no action. With that, I'll throw it back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ethan. Um, any uh, questions at this point of council? Uh, John. Yeah, hey, Ethan, I know that on the the project that was proposed in, in Nevada recently as well at the hotel up there, you know, the, the initial price of, I think, the $18 million that the seller was asking could be reduced by a, 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 an appraisal that was supposed to be done by the county. Um, has a similar been done on the current property? Is, is, a, is a most recent appraisal been done? And does it match up with those dollars? Or is this just the asking price from um, the seller of the building? 
It's a great question. And the $1.54 million reflects the appraised value. So it already has been dropped a little bit from what that initial amount was. And if you have more questions about that, I saw Lily pop up and she, she's been working specifically on that element of this project as well. Okay. And so just, just quickly, and I mean, Lily, you can perhaps answer this as well, specifically um, on, on the, on the appraisal, since it's, it's changing its use from a commercial office building, to you know, 44 permanent supportive housing units as an end result. How was the appraisal completed? Was it completed as a class B office building or was it completed as a um, 44 unit residential permanent supportive housing building that support services? The appraised value for the fair market. Good evening, uh, council members. Lily Thomas with the Marin County Community Development Agency. Mm -hmm. The appraised value is based on the highest and best use um, so for this property, they looked at it as an office building as the, and that's, that's under the, the terms of the appraisal when they're appraising the market value, they look at, at the highest and best use of the property. Did they give any, did they give you typically on these commercial appraisals, you'll see, you know, highest and best use, and then you'll see as is, and then you'll see as proposed, Would we not get values on, on, on those as well, or did we just just get high because it'd be interesting to see you know what the, the, the difference the difference would be between highest and best use as an office building to what it's currently going to be yeah usually appraising affordable housing is a is a quite a unique process because the the value it really costs more than it than it produces right so it's a losing a money losing endeavor so that usually is not it doesn't appraise, if you're appraising it as an affordable housing use, it'll appraise significantly lower than what the, the typical market value would be. Um, but there was a range of, of um, prices in the appraisal. And we since we're still in the real estate negotiation process, the details of the appraisal haven't been formally re um, released, but but this, you know, there was a range that were evaluated and this was the, the highest and best use. And that was what the um, agreement that we had with the owner was, was to look at the, the highest and best, um, highest appraised value for the property. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I hear you and I, I would say that as, as the owner of the building, that's probably what anybody would want is the highest and best use of that. But um, are we, you know, being the fiduciary of taxpayer dollars, are we looking at it from the standpoint of what he could sell that property in today's market for now? Because my guess is, is that he couldn't get the highest and best use if he put it out on the market right now or probably within the next 12 to 18 months. And, and, and my fear is, is that, and my concern is, is that because of the time constraint that we have on this to act on these funds, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I'm fully supportive of the project. Um, and I think it's, I, we've been talking about this, in, as you know, in, in the city for a while, um, but it, it's, it's almost, uh, you know, you know, the, get, feel to some extent getting taken advantage of because of the time constraint and the lack of ability to negotiate a price because we have this burden to close this deal by December 1st. So we're beholden to the seller knowing farewell that in today's market that that building's been vacant for about a year now um as, as far as i mean the last tenant i think moved out about a year ago um and so there there hasn't been even before covid there wasn't a whole lot of movement on that building so um i would be interested to to see truly what a a building like that would go for in a time like now if he was to market it right now would he be getting highest and best use yeah so this question about the value of a property right now when they're in the, we're in the midst of the pandemic is really a difficult process and, and it, that's particularly true of a motel so when you're appraising a motel and you're in the midst of a pandemic where it hasn't been leased up you know some of our one of the properties that we looked at had been used for um, emergency responders, but the other one had been vacant, right? Because because they were closed down for the during the pandemic, and so it's a difficult process to uh, to appraise um, 
a property in this time. That said, our real estate negotiators have not just taken the owner's um, asking price. There has been negotiation. They've looked. We've looked at the conditions of the property. We've had um, a extensive uh, physical needs assessment done on each of the properties that we ha- are evaluating. We've had an ADA accessibility study done on it so that we know what the condition of the property is. And if there's anything that needs to be met, that that's part of the negotiation. Um, the properties, all of them, uh, it, it, you know, it have been less than what the, the seller wanted and, and our real estate negotiators have had negotiated down to address the, the needs that, you know, the, the renovation needs of the properties. So I, I feel like they have done their due diligence, although most of the funds, as um, Ethan pointed out, most of the funds are coming from the state. We all have local dollars that are invested in the property and we have been diligent and careful to ensure that we are doing a fair appraisal and that there, our real estate negotiators are have been um, conservative when when um, negotiating with the owners of the property. In, in, in a spirit of transparency, when will that appraisal be made available to the public? Um, they're made available after the property closes, and that is the real estate typical process when they're when the county is negotiating with the real estate that the appraisal and any and all of those reports can be made available to the public when either when the property the county um, is no longer pursuing the sale or they've closed on the real estate deal so not 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 shooting the messenger here but it sounds a little bit backwards to me if if being asked to supply a large amount of of trust funds prior to knowing the details, the specific details around the, the, the purchase agreement. Um, and I believe you know, you're after, right. after those are done, you know, we get to see, you know, what we, what we're paying for. I believe your staff have seen the appraisal. It's been made available at the staff level. It's just not a public document at this point while the, those negotiations are going on. And that's both, um, in the interest of the county, but also in the interest of the of the seller. Councilmember Gamlin, the one thing I would add too is I I think because um, this question came up at another um, city's council meeting was how did a commercial property end up in this kind of motel hotel portfolio? And so the county had sent out a request for interest to basically all the hotels and motels in the county to see if people were open to selling. Um, that was back when the original home key application was submitted. This particular property, the owner had approached the city, uh, I guess it was close to maybe two years ago, uh, with the idea of maybe selling this building. At that time, there had been an appraisal done that it put the price at closer to $8.3 million. And we had independently verified whether or not that was accurate or not. Uh, and that seemed fair at the time uh, based on, I just looked back through my email and, and verified that. Um, and now the price has dropped over a million dollars from that. So I would say that from where we started a couple of years ago, it has come down, you know, at least, you know, six, six, seven figures. So. No, I, I, I hear you. And I appreciate that. As I recall those numbers as well, it's just being, it's just being said that, Obviously, we're in a time where there is a lot of vacancy. There is a lot of a lot of buildings out there, and I'm not concerned about the, the fact that it's a commercial building versus a motel. If this person wants to sell it, great, and if it, if it makes sense to do, I just want to make sure that everybody, you know, you know, we're again the whole the whole purpose of these trust funds is it's we're the trustee of those, and we have to make sure that we're allocating those appropriately, like what we did with the previous one with Whistle Stop and. And with Mill Street, we know exactly what we're getting and exactly what we're doing. And I understand completely that there is a time crunch on this. And if we snooze and we don't act, then those funds get go to someone else, um, you know, and, and we don't have this opportunity. here. So I'm, I'm very much aware of that. It just would be ideally it would be better if there was a little bit more um, transparency and openness to this process. Um, and but we're not in that. Well, ideal let me. Situation. Uh... Let me let me ask on that because uh, I, John, I, I frankly I think your 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 point of uh, concern is valid. Uh, I wouldn't mind negotiating this deal, but 
maybe that's uh, maybe it's beyond that point. But I do have a question with regard to your point, which is, <clears throat> um, what if what if we appointed a, a subcommittee, perhaps John and I or whoever else might be interested, um, to review this in um, I don't know if we can do closed session, but to review it under a subcommittee. Uh, if you want to put some conditions on that, we don't disclose it, et cetera, et cetera, um, depending on those. But generally speaking, let's say we would subscribe to those. Uh, would that be uh, something that could be done? Because John is right. These are our funds. And you're asking us to fund this project, which I think we're in favor of. My, I am, and I, I, therefore, I, I think most of us are, if not all. However, we are writing the check. And it seems a little bit, as John said, uh, backwards uh, to a request the funds of us without knowing why we're paying the amount that has been prescribed. Um, so w one thing to, to hop in real quick, um, the, to, to, to kind of compare to the, the recent NOFA process, this application has submitted all the same documentation that was required as part of the NOFA process that uh, Mill Street and Whistle Stop went through. Um, additionally, the per unit fee, um, the per unit amount is lower than both Whistle Stop and um, uh, Mill Street. Um, so looking at um, similar criteria, uh, this project would kind of meet those. I just wanted to flag that because it, um, when we're talking about what was submitted, um, I just want to make sure that we, we do have the same um, set of documentation for the application in and of itself as we use to evaluate previous trust fund projects. That may be true, and I'm sure that it is. However, having said that, it's also commercial property, and, and uh, we know, I'll say we know, I, I, I think I know, I'm sure John does, uh, the commercial property, the value of commercial properties has taken quite a dip because of COVID, and I, that may be a permanent uh, decline. I don't know what, I, you know, I've done the evaluation. I'm a CVA uh, certified valuation analyst. So I know a little bit about this stuff and, uh, but I've seen nothing. And then we're asked to write a check for a million five, million five forty. Um, geez, that's a little hard to swallow when we know the value has recently declined. I mean, what, what's our, what's our charge in this? Uh, it seems to me to make sure that we're getting full value for the amount that we're expending. Because we'll be using this for something else that'll help the community, if not this. So I'm not totally persuaded at this point. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, if I could, uh, Jim to chime in, because I may be off base on this, and, and that's not my intention. But uh, Before he does, could I point. just could I clarify um, yeah. on the appraised value? Um, there, the appraised value ranged between 7.2 to 7.4, and so we're actually at the bottom of those th of the values that but we're I would ask at when the that lowest was range. Well, see, what I don't have, uh, <clears throat> and so therefore I'm not questioning you, believe me, but I'm, I, I'm saying what what uh, evidence do I have that five, uh, the, the, well, our uh, 1.54 is a good number. I don't know when the valuation was done. I don't know the qualifications of the evaluator. I don't know the terms and conditions under which the appraisal was made. I don't know any of that stuff. And am I going to write a check for a million five? I, I'm somewhat hesitant to do so. I'm just speaking for myself now. The other council members can make their decision. But am I comfortable with that? I, frankly, I don't think I am. But Jim, you might have something to share with us on this. Not to put you on the spot, but I'd be interested. I have, a, I have something to share. If you don't mind, I have a couple of questions first for Lily, which is this. If you wouldn't mind going through when the valuation was done and who provided it, and then also, can you talk a little bit about timing of of uh, of the board of supervisors on this? Sure. The appraisal was completed in September, late September, the twenty fifth of September, I believe. It's done by Simple Appraisals, um, and the county has used them in other. Um, appraisals that we've worked on. So there are known and experienced. Um, they're based here um, in San Rafael on Professional Center Parkway. So you may be familiar with them yourself. I, I, I believe that they're fairly well known. Um, and then the timing for this is that the board is scheduled to 
um, sign this to approve the final sale of the property on the 10th of, of November. So um, we're under a fairly aggressive timeline, as you mentioned. It's And we've heard this throughout the process and cities and, and communities are hearing this throughout the state that this is a really aggressive timeline and it's difficult. And it's not the typical process that we would go through not, you know, engaging the community, working with our partners, such as the city there, you know, it, it's definitely not an ideal process. Um, and the, and we are, the state has these monies, which will be um, no longer available if they're not spent by the end of the, of the year. And they also want to make sure that if, if our project is not going to go forward, if we're going to go, if our project is not going to proceed, that they make those funds available to another community in California who's also trying to address their um, housing for their, their most vulnerable folks. So we have kind of a double du um, duty of making sure that we are housing the folks in our community, but also that if we're not able to use those dollars, we let another community use them and that they'll have enough time to be able to do their due diligence and close by the end of the year. So those are some other um, considerations for these that the, the state is looking at. Thanks. Can I just confirm, did you say September 25th of, of this calendar year, 2020? September 28th, yes. Okay. So very, quite recent. So, so Mayor, I think staff has had a chance to, to look at the appraisal, and I think that we found it to be appropriate for the site, particularly given the, the value history of the site that, that Andrew Henning was talking about. I think it, at this point, it might make sense if there aren't any other questions to take public comment and get input from the community. Um, and then we can come back on this issue. It, it doesn't appear that that there's time to kind of go through a, a separate process on the appraisal. It doesn't, but it, it seems it seems appropriate from a staff perspective. What what's already been completed? Appreciate the comment. I, I frankly don't agree with it, uh, but I, I appreciate the comment. Um, and let's uh, let's ask for a public comment and we'll come back and, and see if we can get in a better place. So unless there are other comments from council members, which I don't see. Oh, Vice Mayor Collin, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I just had a quick comment because I also want to hear from the public mayor. I want to respond to um, what are we getting for this amount of money? And I just wanted to reiterate something that Ethan had talked about, which we it was important to us on that, this housing fund, which was the leverage, the ability for the uh -huh. dollars to leverage and you said it was four to it was at four to one, or I can't remember the dollars that you used. And so, I to me, and I understand the importance of getting uh, our bang for our buck. Uh, but that is exactly what we wanted with this this fund, and to be able to move expeditiously. So, I do have other comments, but you know, I can wait until after we hear from the public. Okay, and I'm sure we all do. So let's let's go. Thank you for your comment. Let's go to a public uh, for comment at this point. If you are participating by telephone and you wish to speak, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified the host is inviting you to participate and you need to press star six to unmute yourself. If you are participating on YouTube, please submit your comments now. And please note that when submitting comments on YouTube, you need to write public comment prior to your message if you would like it to be read into the record. As a reminder, we ask that you please speak slowly to allow for effective interpretation of your comments into Spanish. Let me get my timer ready. We have quite a few. Also, before I start, I just wanted to announce that there were a good amount of correspondence received in advance of the meeting, and those are all published, have been sent to the city council, and they also were published on the agenda with, along with the agenda. Okay. We're going to go ahead and notify someone to press star six. Hi, this is Linda Jackson. I am Program Director of the Aging Action Initiative. AAI is a collaborative network of over 180 agencies, healthcare providers, and community-based organizations working for the well-being of older people in Marin County. There are hundreds of older renters in San Rafael who have either lost their homes or are on the verge of losing their homes. 
Many are women. Many are frail. Many have no place to live but in their cars. In a recent session that we had uh, for information about older people who are homeless, over 75% are over 50. In San Rafael, there are older people who are aging into poverty and homelessness. This is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for San Rafael to take action for the public good, for housing for the lowest income wage earners of our city. So AAI asks that you support Project Home Key. Thank you. Hello. Um, good evening. My name is Dao Wei Wong. I'm a resident of San Rafael, and I currently work as a staff attorney at a local nonprofit law office, Fair Housing Advocates in Northern California, uh, where we do work with low-income tenants, many of whom are disabled and unstably housed. Um, I, too, would like to speak in support of this affordable housing resolution. As we are all, all aware, uh, housing and rental costs have been rising beyond what is affordable for ordinary people. Um, this housing crisis has been exacerbated by the ongoing pandemic, which has placed many more at risk of losing their homes. And, it's, and this has been especially hard for those in our communities who, who are already vulnerable or at risk of homelessness. It is an unfortunate reality that many residents of our community live with mental and or physical health disabilities that impair their ability to live independently and place them at risk of serious health problems arising from COVID. For these disabled residents, having stable housing is necessary in order for them to manage their care and well-being. Studies have repeatedly shown that providing housing is the most cost-effective way to address homelessness and that housing people on average cost less money than simply leaving them on the streets. Once stably housed, disabled tenants are better able to care for themselves and they have a reduced chance of facing medical emergencies or being arrested for minor crimes. As such, if causes of concern, the spending money now on stable housing will result in saving money later in the form of reduced costs to health care and criminal justice spending. Additionally, additionally, approval of this resolution will reaffirm our city's commitment to inclusivity and opportunity Due to our country's history of racism, African-American residents are, on average, have uh, fewer savings and are much more likely to face eviction and homelessness. Fighting against this legacy of systemic racism also means fighting against poverty and deprivation, and it means fighting for housing. By adopting this resolution, the city will be able to create much needed yeah. housing for those who may... Uh, wrap up your comments, please. Uh, we, we need to go on to the next person, but appreciate your comments. Okay. Thank you. Are there others, Lindsay? Uh, oh, okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Lynn Oldham Robinette, and I lived in Center Fell for over 20 years, and I'm Priest who's worked uh, primarily in San Rafael and Corn Madera for over 20 years. I currently work for the Marin Interfaith Council, which belongs to the Marin Organizing Committee, and I strongly support the city's allocation of housing trust funds towards the purchase of 3301 Kerner Boulevard for Project Home Key. Thank you for considering this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Howman. Good evening. And I am a member of the uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Marin. I've also been a 21-year-long resident of San Rafael. And I'm also a member of the Marin Organizing Committee. And I am very much in support of the purchase of 3301 Kerner. Um, We need to house our homeless folks. The Housing First program has been a success with uh, housing over 300 folks who had chronic homelessness. 
I was a member of the REST program, and um, I am very supportive of permanent, supportive housing for our homeless friends. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Phillips, M Vice Mayor Collin, and City Council members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I am Joanne Webster, and I am speaking to you as a member of the Housing Crisis Action Steering Committee. We are a robust network of over 500 Marin housing advocates and 17 organizations, including the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce, working to tackle our housing crisis. We urge you to support approving a housing trust fund grant tonight to the County of Marin for the affordable supporting, supportive housing development at 3301 Kerner Boulevard. Project, funding for this project gives us a chance to continue to address chronic homelessness swiftly by utilizing an existing building and prioritizing housing for our most at-risk adults, children, and families. It will also help San Rafael meet its very low income RENA allocation numbers. The pandemic has exasperated the housing crisis. You've all seen an increase in encampments in our community, and the situation is only going to get worse unless we take swift action this evening. The, fi the financial impacts of COVID-19 are making it even more pressing than ever to support our community members that need the shelter the most. These individuals and families are our neighbors, they're moms, and they're our workers. As a group of business leaders, city planners, union workers, environmental advocates, public servants and educators, all living and working Marin, we urge you to vote yes tonight to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Someone just received a notification to unmute. You will need to press star six. Good evening. My name is Bob Pindoli. I live in North San Rafael. I'm a member of the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative and the Marin Organizing Committee. Both of our organizations strongly support the purchase of 3301 Kerner Boulevard and the allocation of housing trust funds. The purchase of this building would provide four benefits. One, provides backup for Homeward Bound's Mill Street shelter during renovation. Second, provides a safe place for its formerly for formerly homeless residents to shelter in place during COVID. Third, this purchase will help end homelessness in Marin um, by providing 44 units of permanent affordable housing. And finally, these units will count towards Rena's housing towards San Rafael's RENA numbers for very low income housing, which is a very difficult target. Uh, please support the pur this purchase with housing trust funds and collaborate with the county and opening doors to make this dream a reality. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Buenas noches. Feliz Dias de los Muertos. Salam alaikum. Thank you again for having me um, speak tonight to the governing body of the city of San Rafael. My name is Marjorie Delgadillo, and I am a longtime resident of Marin County. I am a daughter of this county as a former foster youth. I have over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit field. I am a graduate of Bahia Vista. Dominican University, and I am a former resident of the Canal area, and now a resident of Gerstle Park area in San Rafael. I come to you today to ask, to plead, to beg, to please consider this amazing project. I know that we are looking at 1.5 million, um, but your own staffer um, at their own request and research has suggested that this is a good price and a good investment. 1.5 million is really a typical house here in Marin County. This would go to house 
many, many residents, not just older senior residents, but children, children and parents. I have worked and spoken to hundreds of youth and parents here in the county over the past decades. And I can tell you, we wouldn't be in such a crazy crisis in the Latinx community if we didn't have to work the two to three jobs that we have to do in order to pay the rent. So if we want to provide a safe and healthy community for all, where kids in the 94901 and the 94903 who maybe go to Bahia Vista or that maybe go to Sun Valley Elementary, that they could have healthy parents and that they could have healthy outcomes, that they have a shot at starting and being a part of this community. Please consider what you're doing and take into account all who will be affected by your actions that you take tonight. Thank you. Is this my time to speak? It is your turn to speak, and if you would lower the volume on your YouTube video. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is Salama Lauk, and I'm speaking to you as your Senegal representative to the Commission on Aging, as well as a health. I did. Is that better? Hi, Mayor Phillips and council members. This is Salama Locks, and I am uh, San Rafael's representative to the Commission on Aging, as well as a health pro provider. And for the past, well, since June, I have actually been working with the homeless population in San Rafael and those at risk for homelessness. And um, as a commissioner, uh, equity and inclusion, especially for our elders, as well as our those who are less able, is one of our priorities. Working with Chloe Cook, who is with the Aging and Adult Services, through the telehealth program, I have been personally have the opportunity to see that housing as a determinant of health, those who have been transferred to permanent housing have actually improved in many other ways. They are able to manage their whole person needs. And, and as was said earlier, your research has shown that 90% of those who actually receive housing actually do quite well. So I, as a 39-year uh, resident of the city, would like to put forth my support for this project at 3301 Kerner Boulevard. You have uh, quite an awareness of the, the scope of the issue. We have the finances of the air resources available and have been prudent with those resources. And so I'd say um, my expectation and support is that you go forward with the recommendation to adopt the resolution. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shannon Griffin, and I'm with Marin Organizing Committee through the Community Congregational Church of Tiburon, and I am a resident of San Rafael, a proud one. I work for the county, actually, in the public health department, and I previously worked as a social worker for over 20 years. I've spoken with a number of people who have been affected in their jobs, their employment, and by illness because of the pandemic. Never in my life have I heard such fear and anxiety about the loss of housing as I have since the pandemic? Purchase of the Kerner Building is a win-win for San Rafael, for our residents, and for lessening the city's problems when people are forced to live on the streets. And we all know, 
Homeless is going, homelessness is going to increase once the eviction moratoriums end. I implore you to act with compassion and think strategically and approve the solution. Thank you for your time and your work on this. I would also just like to provide a reminder to please speak slowly so that your comments can be interpreted effectively to Spanish. Good evening. My name is Peter Mendoza, and I'm the Director of Advocacy um, for the Marin Center for Independent Living. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, I, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, Marin Center for Independent Living is also a member of the Aging Action Initiative and the Marin Organizing Committee. Homelessness is and housing preservation is one of the main services that our community comes to. MCIL for Marine Center for Independent Living for support. Our community, people with disabilities, older adults, and young people, and families with children, have really been adversely impacted by COVID 19. Our community experiences homelessness and access to barriers to housing on a regular basis, but it's much worse now. I'm also speaking to you as a person who has a family member who was homeless in San Rafael for an extended period. And while my family member is housed, many of our brothers and sisters with disabilities, young people and older adults, are still experiencing homelessness. There is a significant lack of accessible and affordable housing in our communities. Statistics bear out that when the person was housed, once a person receives housing support through being housed, they're able to be, get reacclimated back into their lives, return more into their community, participate, achieve employment, go back to school, address their disability needs, and improve their quality of life. So I come before you to echo many of the voices here tonight and ask you to uh, support this proposal. Housing is a right, and it's something that everyone deserves. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comment. And once again, we're approaching the uh, top of the hour, and therefore, uh, again, the interpreter has requested uh, a break, short break, uh, which we shall uh, now honor and return for additional public comment. Five minute break. Thank you.
We're ready, Mr. Mayor. We're ready, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, after a short break, we will continue our public uh, discussion of affordable house and trust fund under 5D. Further public comment, please. Hi, um, this is, my name is Catherine and I just moved to San Rafael. I'm a renter here. I pay more than half of my income to rent and um, yeah, I'm 26 years old, just trying to, you know, do my life and figure things out. But anyways, I support the Home Key program. I will keep it short. Um, your priority with all of that money needs to be providing actual low income and affordable housing. And that's all. Okay. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sammy Miracle with the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, which is a member of the Marin Organizing Committee. I am speaking to ask you to immediately approve the use of housing trust fund dollars for Project Home Key. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ron Brown. I'm a member of Congregation Kol Shafar, a member institution of the Marin Organizing Committee, and I support the position taken by other MOC members tonight favoring the acquisition of the property at 3301 Kerner. I am also a resident of San Rafael, living in the Bay Point Lagoons community. My house, in fact, is about a five-minute walk from 3301 Kerner. I believe that this supportive housing facility will serve a valuable goal, taking homeless people off the streets and providing them with the services needed to move forward with their lives. <clears throat> and I also believe that it will have no negative impact on my community. I urge you to support this res resolution. Thank you. Noemi, I have a caller over on your line. I'm gonna go ahead and Request to unmute, you'll need to press star six. Adelante. No le escucho, si por favor puede activar su micrófono oprimiendo estrella seis. Si me escucha, por favor, oprima estrella 6. Uh, no, I mean, you know what? I'm not hearing you on that line. I, 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 I'm here, uh, but I'm not hearing anyone. Oh, I see. Actually, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to our, to our uh, YouTube comments. Okay. My name is Margaret Fisher. I have been a Marin resident for the past 30 years. Centerfell is our county's heart. We work here, we shop here, see movies, go out to eat and see medical providers. Over time, I have seen more and more homeless folks, some mentally ill, some just down on their luck, sleeping on the streets here in Centerfell. This is particularly serious in the winter rains. Some homeless are vets who have served, or served and suffered for us. Some are pregnant women who have no place to go. As we move forward in the pandemic and the descending economy, as well as into the winter rains, it is imperative we have somewhere to house our less fortunate brothers and sisters. Going forward, the numbers of homeless are just going to grow. In this relatively wealthy county, no one should have to sleep in the streets. Give the rare opportunity of this state project home key funding through the county. Centerfell's contribution of housing trust fund money. It will model a collaborative approach to addressing homelessness on a countywide basis. And there will not have to be new building develop, a new building developed. 
I ask you to approve and adopt the resolution approving a housing trust fund grant to the County of Marin for the affordable housing development at 3301 Printer Boulevard. Second comment, name withheld. I'm glad to see Center Fell prioritizing temporary and transitional housing for our most vulnerable residents as the Mill Street Shelter Project did. However, when will the council start finding locations outside of the canal for these locations? Already the most densely populated area with high needs and now another location selected here. Please make this a goal. My name is Kate, that, her introduction is, my name is Kate Sprague and I'm a resident of the canal. Thank you for taking time to hear my comment. A name withheld. I support using the Housing Trust Fund for permanent supportive housing in Center Fell. We must support our most vulnerable neighbors. Housing with wraparound services is an amazing approach. I'm a resident of Center Fell and I support the move to fund public housing on Kerner Boulevard. Our unhoused neighbors are struggling so much right now and need all the help they can get. Housing is so necessary for mental health recovery, addiction recovery, safety, and health. This is Nick Morris, Executive Director at the Street Chapel Chaplaincy. We strongly advocate for the Kerner property to be funded to support our most vulnerable, unsheltered neighbors. Josh Sullivan. I'm a supervising attorney at Legal Aid of Marin, an MOC member and a resident of Center Fell since the late 1990s. Legal Aid of Marin implores you to rise above the misinformed voices who oppose this and who oppose this and related projects. Please do the right thing for our community. Create permanent supportive housing in Marin. Sincerely, Josh Sullivan. I'm the director of Downtown Streets team. Sorry, this is Karen Strolia. I'm the director of Downtown Streets team in the North Bay and as part of a community collaboration around coordinated entry, we collectively have a track record of success. These sites accelerate the success of our coordinated entry system, which has housed nearly 300 of our community's most vulnerable chronically homeless people over the last three years. If we don't move on these projects, we miss out on tens of millions of dollars in state funding. More importantly, this program is an, this program is an effort to prevent the spread of COVID amongst our most vulnerable. As a resident of Santa Fe, we are progressive, compassionate, and we stand for equity. This means saying yes in our backyards and understanding that housing is a racial justice for all BIPOC. Catherine Sue, I heard Gamblin say, quote, there's a lot of vacancy right now, close quote. And guess what? There is little to no affordable housing and there are people without homes. Top priority equals to house people. Public comment. I'm a Santa Fe resident and urge the council to support this urgent and important resolution for affordable housing. We have an opportunity to house people which will reduce crime and lead to better health outcomes. Our community needs to show our compassion and care for the most vulnerable unhoused people here. Public comment. I strongly support Project Home Key. Thank you for your quick work on this to help alleviate the immense housing pressure in Marin and elevate a housing first approach to homelessness. Public comment. Without 1.5 million, is the, purchase, is the purchase and development doomed? We need to say yes now to getting property purchases en route to development and housing the homeless. Public comment. I strongly support adoption of home key purchase resolution. The process may not be ideal, but the need is urgent. This is a critical piece of our public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please don't waste this one-time funding opportunity based on process details that are honestly overshadowed by the need to house our house our houseless residents. Thank you. My name is Laura J. Giacomi, and I am a member of the Congregation of Rhoda Shalom, a member of the Marin Organizing Committee. I urge you to support Project Home Key. Thank you. Public comment. Bill Carney, it's critical to proceed now with the purchase based off based on staff's due diligence then for future approvals set a process for prior council involvement to review appraisals 
Centerfeld Chamber of Commerce, we agree with Bill Carney. We need to move forward tonight to leverage these funds for this project and can draft a, draft a process for future funding approvals. My name is Sunny Lee. I request to move Third Street Improvement Agenda item to the next city council meeting to be presented instead of tonight. There's not enough information and time, time given tonight. I have been on this meeting since 7 p.m. and it's been it's now taken over three hours to hear the Third Street Improvement presentation to be heard to the city council. It's not fair to the public. Many residents who have jobs and family duties to attend to is no longer taking their night their night time to attend the meeting and express their concern. Third Street is very important road to is a very important road to consider. Due to housing crisis during COVID, I wholeheartedly understand the importance of the last three agenda items to be heard first. That being said, I request Third Street to be moved to the next agenda item, the next meeting. This is public comment from Liza Blash. I'm asking you to take a leadership role and bring this home key project to fruition. We've heard so many excuses all over Marin for why no one can house the homeless in their communities. We have eight days. We stand to, to lose not only this project, but all three of them. You could really make a difference by settling the tone and modeling your willingness to collaborate with the county on this purchase. This purchase is the culmination of 10 years of activism and volunteerism on the part of local religious institutions to house the homeless in their institutions. Please, please step up and set an example by moving forward on this housing. On this housing. Public comment. I support the 3301 Kerner resolution for Project Home Key. This is an important opportunity. Public comment. Swift action must be taken so that, so that we can assure a safe and healthy community for all, including our Latinx neighbors and all others as this virus affects us across neighborhood lines. I have a couple more comments coming in, so I'm just gonna revert back to our telephone line. Hello, this is John Reynolds uh, living in the canal. Of course, I was a long time involved with Homeward Bound and Mill Street. The homeless are residents. They need to be reached out to and supported in all ways. We have a great opportunity to have homeless shelter transitional housing happen in Novato, in Corte Madera, and in San Rafael. We can't pass up that opportunity. You need to lead us. Uh, Mr. Gamlin and Mayor Phillips, we need to lead us to make it possible for Novato and Corte Madera also to move forward on providing homeless housing at this time. And, and, and let's not uh, wait it. You know, urgency of the now is now. Action needs to be taken with the trust fund money now. And I agree with Bill Carney. I agree with the Chamber of Commerce saying that we can appraise the possibility of other projects coming up, the Whistle Stop, uh, 855 C Street, there's other options of funding. You can be creative with the funding going forward. Let's go with Bill Carney. We, let's go with the Chamber of Commerce and say, let's go ahead with this. It's on the, it's on our plate right now. Let's move forward with it and then reappraise how we use the trust fund money later. Please do this on behalf of MOC and the canal and everybody else. Thank you. Mary Kay Sweeney, if you're on the line, you'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Go back to our public comments. My name is Omar Carrera, CEO at Canal Alliance. As someone who has been working from day one on the front line in response to COVID-19, I can assure you that the lack of rapid response and the approval of this project 
could put at risk all the space gained in the fight against the pandemic and reopening the economy. Connecting people to stable housing should be a high priority for all elected officials. Providing housing not only helps slow the spread of COVID-19, but also provides safety and dignity to hundreds of homeless people in our cities. Project Home Key complements the work we are doing on the policy working group. I urge you to support this project. Public comment. It should be noted that a body of white individuals are making the decisions that will directly impact a majority of people of color. They have given you their thoughts. Listen. Looks like we have no more callers on our lines. Lindsay, do we, we want to try one more time? Just um, yeah. council members, just so you know, Mary Kay is on the, the line. I think we're just having some technical issues. Um, she was going to share. I've just asked you to go ahead and unmute. And I'm going to go ahead and call you on the other line. So if you get a call from a strange number, that's me. Hi, it's Lindsay, the city clerk for the city of Centerfell. And I'm going to go ahead and put you on speakerphone. Okay, one moment. All right, you're ready. All right, thank you so much. You did it. Goodness, the wonders of modern technology. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Mayor and city council members. Um, I, I'm, my name is Mary Kay Sweeney, and I'm uh, with Homeward Bound and Marin, of course. And I urge you to approve the Housing Trust Fund for 3301 Kerner. You know, the process, it hasn't been ideal. There's no question about it. Everyone would have liked to have more time, but we don't have more time. We have to really think outside our box this time around to really make this happen because it's rare that we have this kind of an opportunity. So I appreciate your really thoughtfulness in, in looking at this uh, housing trust fund grant, and I really, really urge you to approve it. Um, we don't have these kinds of opportunities come up that frequently, so thank you. Okay, okay. and goodbye, Mary Kiss me. Okay. I'm just checking. We have no more YouTube comments and no more callers on the line, so that concludes public comment for this item, Mr. Mayor. In which case we shall uh, close public comment. Um, and I'll just make a, a brief brief uh, uh, statement, which is uh, speaking for myself and, and certainly other council members can do so as well. But speaking for myself, I'm in favor of the project. Let, let me be perfectly clear on that. Uh, for all of the reasons cited, uh, many I thought were outstanding. Uh, so the first issue is, uh, or the first hurdle perhaps is, are you in favor of the project? And the answer is yes. However, there's a remaining question in any purchase that anyone makes, uh, be it a million five or for a new car for you know 20 grand. And that is, uh, what is what is the premises for the value? And we are spending a considerable amount of money if this goes forward uh, as proposed uh, on, on this uh, without knowing much about it the valuation based upon. Frankly, we as, as policymakers don't know, or at least I don't, and I would challenge any of us to give me the details if you think you do. That's the second issue, separate and distinct from the first. So what I, I would suggest, and, and uh, uh, John, you can override this, but we, we do have a finance committee. That finance committee is made up of two council members, period, they are John and myself, and therefore I would suggest that we uh, request the finance committee, made up again of Councilmember Gamble and myself, review this evaluation. And I would suggest that I can do it as as soon as tomorrow. Uh, John, you'll have to comment on on the timing. I, I don't have your calendar, but I could do it as early as tomorrow, if the council decided to 
make uh, the approval contingent upon that review. And uh, just again, speaking myself, unless it's significantly different uh, from what has been suggested, that is the million five, uh, I would furthermore suggest that we we default to the approval if that's the way it's going, that's the way it feels to me. You can override that, of course, but that's the way it feels to me. Uh, however, if let's say that we conclude after the review, perhaps with Lily or whomever, uh, as soon as tomorrow, uh, if we conclude it's way off base before we spend a million five, uh, we would ask the council to reconvene in a special meeting to further discuss uh, not necessarily the merits of the project, but rather the price that we're being asked to uh, commit public our public funds for. So I'll ask John if it's okay and then defer to other comments uh, by other council members. John, is that something that you would be willing to uh, partake in? Sure, Mr. Mayor. I mean, uh, you know, we, I, I agree with what you said in that, you know, you and I have been not only on the finance committee, but we've been also on, you know, part of the homeless subcommittee for, for a while and, and Ritter relocation subcommittee. So we've been, we've been looking at opportunities in, in the city of Santa Rafa for a long time, places to build more supportive housing. We're, we're both strong supporters of this. And I, I, I don't want to give the impression to any of the callers or any of the people chiming in on, on YouTube that we're not in support of this project. We do, we do. And so as, as the mayor said, I, I wholeheartedly support you know, the, the building of additional permanent supportive housing in San Rafael. Um, and this is a, this is a location that we've looked at. The, the second part of that is the mayor, you know, eloquently provided is that we have a duty to make sure that we're spending the city's money appropriately and, and doing our due diligence. And that's all we're doing here is making sure we have all the information in front of us. Um, I know there is a very short time period to do this. Um, I'm happy to review any additional documentation you know, with you, Mr. Mayor, on this. Um, and if that means that we give it, give it approval tonight, um, you know, pending, pending that review so that we, we can get this to the, the Board of Supervisors within their deadline, I would hate to have us miss out on an opportunity um, of, of these funds for our community. Um, that's, that's not my intent at all. Um, I will have, I will, I do want to say though, as well, one of the things that, that was brought up by at least one of the callers or one of the commenters was that, you know, we tend to, and it's not by purpose because this program basically put out a request for anybody willing to sell a property. And the responses that we received were this property. Um, as, and Andrew, or Lee, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we received any other proposals to sell a property to fill this program request this time around other than 3310 Kerner. So for the folks that are saying, you know, we've got to look for places other than our canal and East Santa Fell neighborhood to support permanent supportive housing, you're absolutely correct. We do. Um, and if there were other buildings that were raising their hand to want to be sold, um, we could have looked at those, but um, I don't believe that that was the case. And so we're not pigeonholing this project to a specific um, area that is already um, perhaps um, uh, you know, overburdened with with other, you know, housing and 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 homeless initiatives that are going on, but it, it is what we have in front of us right now. So, long answer to your question. Happy to help if that's something that we're able to do, um, and to be able to look at that tomorrow um, is fine. Mayor, I have a question. As I understand it, the resolution is written in a do not exceed amount. So it would be a possible to have an approval tonight and still have a chance to view, review the appraisal as, as, as you want to do, but we can still move forward. Um, is, could Andrew or Ethan clarify on that? I mean, I have additional comments, but, but that's my first question. Well, Andrew, do you have a comment? I mean, uh, I was going to say, Ethan, do you want to subject to the, the appraisal that that's the number that was derived. So, um, was to, to review Probably the more appraisal. than that, uh, but it could be less. We're not talking about paying more. We're talking about paying less. Yeah, the resolution was written as a do not exceed. So I think it, the way that this conversation is going, it wouldn't be that we'd be paying more than what's being uh, what's on the resolution tonight. So I, I think I think we could um, approve what we have and then make it contingent on having that 
financial review? Well, well, when you say contingent, I mean, for me, I, I guess I'm not clear um, what it is for the mayor and council member Gavlin to see in order to move forward on it. And I understand that the appraisal is not on any number that's been described to you, mayor. I, I, I heard that in loud and clear, but I do know that Lili, as well as our staff has looked at this number, it's been well vetted. Um, and I have confidence in that. And, and for me, I wanna move in within their time frame. If we have a little bit more time, that's fine, but if but if not, I I wouldn't want to lose this. And and just to comment on, on the the timing, I mean, COVID has really taken all this playbook and thrown it out the window. And we all recognize that. Um, but this housing and this type of housing, as we've all said, and I I, I won't belabor the point, but it is what is in our approved um, housing policies. So I, I think we're all in agreement about this project, and I wouldn't want the the timing coming down from the state to have us lose it. So I don't know. Lily, sorry to put you on the spot about the timing because I, I really want us to be aware if we're going to spend additional time doing something for me that I personally uh, don't need in order to approve this tonight, but but I want to understand the full picture. Well, let me just comment and Lily, you can jump in. And that is, uh, I've already outlined the timing. The timing would be for John and I to uh, review this uh, with Lily or anyone that she uh, or Andrew might think uh, be most appropriate tomorrow. Now, if let's say we conclude that it's, it's within a reasonable parameter, it's not an absolute number, but is it a reasonable result uh, based on the data that they've derived this evaluation on? If, if yes, if, they, uh, if we are satisfied that it's reasonable, the end of story based on the motion. So somebody's gonna have to start thinking about the motion. If, however, we have a significant concern with regard to the million and a half that's being asked for us to spend, then I would call a special city council meeting so that the balance of the council members could review that and then decide. And you, well, there's a couple of possibilities. Um, let's say that we conclude a million five by 40, if you wish, is way beyond what uh, the market would bear at this point in time, then you might want to think about spending a million five. However, you still have the opportunity to say, okay, I understand, but I'm still willing to spend that amount uh, for the building. So you'll have two choices if it comes to that. So John and I'll review it. If we're satisfied, that's the end of the story. If we're not satisfied, then then it's a significant, in my from, from my uh, vantage point only. I can't speak for John. Um, I am. I am not going to nickel and dime this thing. Uh, it would have to be significant. In other words, I would. I would conclude that it's uh, important for council members to weigh in on this additional factor. And you may still, or collectively, we may still say, "Okay, let's go forward." But at least you'll have the comfort of having you know, kick the tire, so to speak, uh, or review the evaluation. And I, I think we're reasonably competent to do so. Uh, I, I frankly uh, be surprised if there is a significant uh, difference, but before I write a check for a million and a half, I want to be comfortable. And we are being asked, not the staff, we are being asked to write a check for a million 540 without frankly anything uh, that we have, we as council writing the check have before us. But Lily, sorry, you may. So uh, I, I just would like to clarify that, you know, unfortunately, my real estate staff are not here. I am not, this is not my field of expertise. I am project managing all three of our acquisitions where we have a, a variety of folks who are involved with it. But we have a real estate team made up of three um people who do real estate for the county. They're seasoned, they're experienced, and they are overseeing the process of all three of our acquisitions. So as you may know, the county, in addition to 3301 Kerner, is also pursuing two additional sales, one in uh, Cornemdera and one in Novato. And so they are, ha they ha are looking at, at all of these issues at all three of the properties. And I, I am 
confident that if if they were on the phone or if they were here with us, they would be able to walk you through this process and explain it to you and and give you a high level of of confidence in it. Like we all are relying on them, and and luckily. I'm not alone on doing this because this is definitely not my field of expertise. I can look in their praise all but I, I am not, it, this is definitely not my field, but, but they, they, it is their field and they do have that expertise and um, I'm confident in them as it, as is our board. And I, I do know that you are, you don't have all the information and it's a strange position to be in. It's probably similar if you were funding a project like, Whistle Stop or perhaps Mill Street where you haven't seen their appraisal and you haven't seen all of their detailed financial analysis like that, that, that may be typical in, in evaluating an affordable housing development. But yes, it, um, it is made more um, difficult by the fact that we are in a pandemic. So, and yes, the real estate market is changing day to day and, it, and it's volatile right now. I understand your concerns. And I, and I appreciate that because, quite frankly, uh, you made reference to the appraiser. They're not here, so we don't have insight from them. I mean, if they were here, we could ask a question or two and, and draw our own conclusion. Uh, so we're, we're lacking uh, that piece as well. And we know that there is a, uh, there's been a significant shift in the, uh, in the commercial market. I mean, it's not like, oh, gee, you know, we don't know what's going on. We know, uh, I would suggest that we know, that the uh, commercial real estate market is is in a state of flux, and I think for a permanent period of time. And the data you mentioned, the report is out on, uh, or was, I think, produced on September 26th or some such date. I'd be curious about the data that was used in generating the, the value. Was that a year ago? Was that six months ago? When was that? I don't know that either. So it's right. different because of the time, changing times that we're in. And again, the time frame, it seems to me, uh, I mean, if you can't uh, join us, I, I certainly understand the short notice. If they can't, and I've quite frankly looked at their resumes. And I think it would be appropriate for us to take this step. If they can't join us, they produced a report. And uh, uh, John and I could probably read that pretty quickly. So, so Mayor, just such to, as this need to stand on their own. I mean, I know that professionally, quite frankly. So, Mayor, just to clarify, and I understand how fast you're willing to move on this in order for you to kick the tires yourself, but I did want to hear from Lily. It does the timing work. I, I just want to hear from you. If there's a delay, if it's not approved tonight, can this project move forward? I just want to have clarity. I don't have clarity around that. So the board is scheduled to um, approve the final um sales and purchase agreement for this property on November 10th. Right. Um, without this um, commitment, they are either going to have to decide to postpone that or um, commit um, to using our, our housing trust in, additional, in addition to the match that we're doing for the other two projects. So I don't know which of those options, but those are the two options that they would have to do. Um, this project, because it was a waitlisted project, we don't actually have to close escrow until the 2nd of December. Our other project has to close on the 18th of November. So technically there could be, I believe that the board could push, I push it, but there was noticing that was done. And I don't know if there's time to re-notice those meetings, because the way when the county is purchasing real estate, you have to um, notice the hearing and there has to be three weeks between each hearing. So I don't think that there's time for us to notice the next meeting, the next board meeting, which is on the 17th. So unless our board was able to move forward with their action on the 10th and feel comfortable that they were willing to fill that gap if the, if the city was not, if they wanted to provide that match, it could put the project in jeopardy. Well, in other words, to make, to make sure I'm clear on this, if, uh, if John and I were to review this tomorrow, and there, like I said, there are two possibilities. We say, okay, the uh, report is well prepared, professionally prepared, which I'm sure it will be. And we can, 
we concur with the uh, the conclusions within a reasonable reasonable amounts. If we do that tomorrow, then that's certainly before November tenth. If, however, we say, wait a minute, there's something here that other council members should be aware of before committing those funds. And if we were to do that this week, that still is before November 10th. So I see no reason for not taking this step. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Andrew McCullough. Well, I'd just like to make a, a motion. I think we've talked this through extensively. I'd like to make a motion and a comment and then see if uh, anyone wants to follow the motion or the comment or both. But before I do either, would it make sense for us to consider postponing as, as, as was requested by one of the pub members of the public, the next agenda item, or do you intend, Mr. Mayor, would you like to proceed with it this evening? Well, I, I that's a really good question. I appreciate it. I, I guess I have the November 10th is sort of a, a critical date and therefore I was thinking of you know getting on it uh, addressing it this week uh, I'm a little bit less certain of that November 10th which was cited earlier but if that's still a pretty hard and fast day we can deal with it if necessary I, uh, Mr. I Mayor, I'm sorry I'm talking about the third street improvements item on the agenda the last item on the agenda oh I'm what uh, yeah, remember, there was a member of the public in the last set of public comments who right. said, on the Third Street improvements, can we put it over because families are going to bed and he's been oh, waiting since 7 p.m. Uh, I, I apologize. I was focusing on this. That's okay. Um, I, I, I well, let's for finish one, this. Let's finish I mean, this. Let's, okay, let's, let's try let's to wrap finish. it up. Is there a motion well, with I, regard to this yeah, item? I, I would move that we... Um, authorize the expenditure of up to $1,540,000 uh, for the use uh, recommended by staff in the staff report, subject to the review by the finance committee as soon as tomorrow of the appraisal and other factors that went into that $1,540,000 number, and that we delegate to them the authority to um, confirm the number and authorize staff and particularly the city manager to uh, execute the necessary documents. And that if there is material concern on the part of the finance committee, that a special session of the council be convened in enough time that we can make a decision that meets the uh, schedule imposed or required by the county. Second. Moved and seconded, roll call please. Uh, I'm sorry, stop, uh, my mistake. A any additional comments with regard to the motion? I don't agree with the motion. I, I'm fully uh, confident in the kicking of the tires. I love that term. I have to use it again. That was already done, so I will be voting no. Okay. Other comments? In which case, uh, there's a motion on the floor. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Cullen. No. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Councilmember McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye, that matter carries 4-1. Uh, and we uh, we shall uh, convene tomorrow morning. John and I will work out a calendar and or a schedule and uh, and get back to you if, if necessary. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Bushy, do you have a comment? Are we gonna do Third Street? Yes, we're gonna do it okay, right now. Okay, let's go. Uh, third, uh, third Street Improvement, last agenda item E, um, information report, uh, apparently Bill is on the, on the firing line. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Council Bill Guerin with the Department of Public Works. I am going to, I've already asked my uh, presenters to be very quick tonight. Uh, we have a couple of areas of Third Street that we want to focus on, and they're going to do that. They're going to focus on the areas that are of concern to the public. I would like to introduce April Miller, who is the senior uh, civil engineer in public works, and Robert Stevens, who is the uh, principal at CSW Stuber Stroh. Uh, Robert is going to walk us through the presentation material uh, with April's help, and then we'll be happy to field any questions that come up. So, uh, April, Robert, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. One of you two is. Go right ahead. They better not be sleeping. 
Thank you, Bill, thank you, members of the council and mayor. I really appreciate this opportunity to come tonight and present our update to the Third Street Improvement Project. I'm going to show on my screen the, does everybody see on my screen the uh, presentation? No, we cannot. Still cannot. It's not allowing me to show my screen. I have it pulled up, so let me just go ahead and grab that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And as we get started, I would like just to mention that, um, so thank you for uh, having me here today. My name is Robert Stevens. I am supporting Bill in April on the development of the Third Street uh, Feasibility Project. Uh, so this project, uh, as many you know, it's a basic infrastructure and project that rehabilitates pavement, traffic signals, and utility infrastructure along 2nd Street, from West Street to Shaver, as well as along 2nd Street to just east of Union Street. So in addition to these basic infrastructure enhancements, there's some pretty exciting pedestrian safety and bicycle circulation elements. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now I'm having a technical issue in one moment. So the next uh, image we're gonna look at is actually at the Lutons and Lindaro intersection. It's at the Walgreens parking lot entrance. So you can see here in the red ellipse, uh, the driveway to the Walgreens parking lot off of Third Street. Um, there's been several issues at this location, namely one, if you're a pedestrian walking along the sidewalk, you face a traffic signal that you, you must uh, navigate as you cross the driveway. Two, vehicles that are uh, leaving Third Street and entering the parking lot often face congestion within the parking lot and the narrow width of the driveway requires them to slow. This causes backing on Third Street and the potential for rear end collisions. And then finally, uh, we've noted uh, cut through traffic. Vehicles are using the parking lot as a means to uh, pass through the intersection, which creates congestion within the parking lot. Next slide. So here is the uh, recommended improvements that the project would make. Uh, you can see the Walgreens as well as the parking lot and Third Street uh, running east to west here. Uh, the project would install a, a, a proper sidewalk and close the driveway from Third Street into the Walgreens parking lot. It would widen the driveway on Lutons, so vehicles that wanted to enter Walgreens from Third Street would travel down Third Street, take a ride on Lutons, and enter the parking lot. Uh, this option would actually increase parking within the parking facility there by two stalls. In addition, you'll note that along Third Street, there is a uh, reserved left turn lane into Lindaro. And this is a really great option. So when uh, pedestrians are crossing uh, Lindaro, the vehicles that wanna turn left there do not block the through movement on Third Street, uh, keeping capacity uh, strong. Next slide, please. So as we move towards the west uh, into the downtown intersections, namely the A, the B, the C, and the D streets, uh, this is an example of what the project would do. Uh, not only does it repave the roadway, but it actually creates curb bulb outs, which are extensions into the roadway that promote pedestrian visibility and ease uh, crossing of the street. And a secondary benefit of this is it makes the the signal more efficient and more efficiency creates less delay for uh, vehicles that are traveling along the corridor. Also, um, if you've know, if you've driven down Third Street, you'll notice in lane, the lanes adjacent to the sidewalk, it's fairly steep and there's an abrupt transition at the intersections. This would smooth that transition out. Next slide, please. So now we, we know that there is a, a real big interest in improving bicycle access along 2nd Street. And the project actually implements a great bicycle facility consistent with the bicycle and pedestrian master plan along 2nd Street. And tonight we're gonna talk about the segment between West Street and Shaver Street shown as the red line here. 
The future extension there shown in orange is uh, we, we've heard from the community that this is a really important element and there's some challenges uh, at the intersection. We're working through those issues right now and we'll be presenting those to the community coming soon. But tonight, we're just gonna be talking about the segment in red. Next slide, please. So um, the, the project is actually implementing what's known as a class four bikeway. Uh, the image on the left is an example of a bikeway. This is in Point Richmond. It's a protected and reserved uh, lane exclusively for cyclists. So on the image on the left, on the right is a two-way bikeway. Cyclists can travel in each direction and they're separated by those white delineators from the vehicle travel lanes. On the right, this is a one-way bikeway, uh, and you can see it actually has a physical curb that separates the bikeway from the travel lanes. This is in San Francisco. Next slide, please. So here is our second street, and this is the segment between West and East streets. You can see the area uh, delineated in green that is the two-way cycle track on the south side of the roadway. The green is where the bikeway crosses the driveways at the residences. You can also see in this image that there is a new signalized intersection of E Street that really promotes access for motorists as they maneuver through the intersection. And it creates a protected pedestrian movement for folks that are seeking to get from the residences to the commercial district to the north. This uh, design here is an optimization from our September community meeting where folks were really interested in preserving on-street parking. So as you can see, the currently recommended option provides at least 13 parking stalls along this segment of uh, the corridor. Uh, the challenge in this is that um, to get these parking stalls in here, we must narrow the medians. And in narrowing the medians, three existing trees would need to be removed. But the project adds about 50 new trees along the entire corridor. And these 50 new trees would be planted in an appropriate manner so that, that not only do they en will enhance this, the, the, the streetscape, but also function for carbon sequestration. Next slide, please. So this is an image uh, along 2nd Street looking towards the west. You can see the new sidewalk as well as the, the cycle track or the bikeway. Next slide, please. This is an image looking at the intersection of East and 2nd Street where the new signal would be. You can see the two-way cycle track, the parking, uh, and the travel lanes that, that do not change. They're as existing. Next slide, please. And this is an image at 2nd and G Street looking towards the west. You can see the cycle track and the crosswalks and the new signal that would be put in this place. Next slide, please. So, you know, we got to this point by the, the great feasibility study that was reviewed by council in 2019. Uh, it allowed us to really kind of further the concept uh, last uh, earlier this year. We had a great public meeting in September that really provided some excellent feedback that uh, allows for the optimizations that you're seeing this evening. We're really looking forward to your comments and feedback on this because uh, uh, the staff would really like to begin the sequel review and the final design here in the fall and winter of 2020. Uh, we plan for another check-in with the public and community in the winter. Uh, and then hopefully we can get into construction uh, later in the summer of 2021 and be complete within a year. So thank you for uh, hearing this informational update. We'd love to hear your feedback and we're prepared to answer any questions you might have. Well, first, uh, thank you so much for your report and all the work that's gone into this. It's pretty uh, pretty amazing to me. I've, I've seen this uh, report a couple of times and uh, I'm uh, always I'm quite, quite impressed by everybody that's been involved. Uh, Bill and, and certainly April and and uh, others that have been involved, including yourself. So thank you so much for everything you've done. I, I, I think it's a terrific project and I'm in favor of it, but I'll open up to comment and then go to public uh, comment. Uh, Councilmember Gamlin, do you, 
Oh, okay. I, your, your mic's off. Anyone uh, wish to comment on this item before we go to the public? Uh, Mayor, if I, could, if I could just add that it was also brought to the economic subcommittee, which you and I are on. And so they also gave feedback as well. And uh, the kudos were given at that time about how there was so much going on in this small area and that Department of Public Works did a great job of really taking all that input and addressing a lot of different needs in a tight space. So I just wanted to share yeah. that. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with your comments, certainly. Let's go to public. Any public comments at this hour? It's not quite 11. I hate to start things at, after 11. but You still have a few callers. <laughs> if you're participating by telephone and you wish to provide public comment, please press star nine now. Um, and if you're providing comments into the YouTube chat, please be sure to write public comment in advance of your comments so that I know to read it into the record. And also please speak slowly so that your messages will be interpreted properly in Spanish. We have one caller. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, uh, this is Bill Carney. Um, you've seen a letter from Sustainable San Rafael um, clearly, there's been some big changes um, since we last saw this project, and um, you know, abandoning uh, a multi-use path for a two-way bicycle-only uh, lane uh, provides little improvement for pedestrians uh, over the existing conditions, which are certainly not not at all optimal. Um, and along with that, there's some fairly, I would say, tortuous tortuous attempts to um, save a, a few parking spaces as well. Um, this new scheme sacrifices, however, three large median trees, uh, a couple of London Plains and, and a native big leaf maple, um, which are among the best uh, marine species for carbon capture. And believe me, all species are not created equal uh, for carbon capture. Um, this, these particular ones, um, uh, sequester about a ton already uh, of greenhouse gas annually, the three trees together, which is about 5% of a typical household's emissions. So it's, it's not uh, unsubstantial. The, um, the plane trees can be saved uh, simply by giving up five parking spaces. Uh, and if you've heard, there's, uh, I think, 13 altogether here. Um, and... Um, that would be between East and West Street, which was what was previously uh, proposed throughout the development of this project. Um, the maple can be saved by returning to the earlier design of a multi-use pathway between Miramar and, and uh, East Street with no loss of uh, the, the seven or eight curbside parking um, that are spaces that are in that block and uh, with considerably more pedestrian amenity. So because of the carbon capture potential and also the size of these species um, befitting a major boulevard, we also requested London Plains and a related species, Armstrong Maples, be added to the planting pallet for the rest of the third, second corridor. Uh, they're already being very successfully used at Biomarin, both in the existing and in uh, future uh, development. Thank, thank you, Bill. Um, if you could wrap it up, please. Okay, well, we're, we're also very concerned about the uh, intersection at Lindaro uh, from the standpoint of it, it really needs to have a, a crosswalk on the west side of Lindaro. Otherwise, it, there's a desire line that's incredibly intense coming up uh, Lindaro and will be when the Biomarin project is completed. <clears throat> It'll be intensified. So thanks very much for Good. considering Good. this comment. Thank you so much. Anyone else, uh, Lindsay? No one else on the line. However, I do have some from YouTube. Public comment, my, na my name is Lisa Mergian. I am a Santa Fe resident since 1989. Thank you for your time. I have serious concerns about the proposed closure of the Third Street entrance to Walgreens. Public comment. I have two parents who are very concerned of Third Street rehab, but one of them doesn't have Google account to be able to comment here. She wants to postpone the report review and review to next council meeting since it's now three and a half hours in to hear the report and people are no longer able to attend after 1030. Third Street rehab is so important and this can't be short. Bill Guerin, please do not shorten the presentation as this is so crucial for the lives of the people in Southern Centerfell. 
and I have to wait a, about 10 seconds to allow some comments that are coming in through YouTube. Okay. Public comments, going from three to only two lanes for vehicle traffic, that would create heavy traffic backups. I'm seeing, oh, I have one more caller. And Bill, while we're waiting, I'll ask you to comment on the last uh, last two points, if you would, after uh, public, after, after public. Thanks, Mayor. Hello, my name is Alan Edmondson. Um, I'm in San Rafael, and I um, was recently um, helping to lead up the, the project to plant trees over in Marin Lagoon. There were so many volunteers of people wanting to plant that couldn't get everybody, you know, we couldn't even take all the volunteers. Such is the uh, number of people who really enjoy trees. So I'm speaking to that Second Street refinement, um, as it was called, um, which called for eliminating those trees in the median strip um, and think that uh, that needs to be reconsidered. The median trees, they, they preserve a, a semblance of this is that you're passing through a neighborhood when you have overhanging trees and, and then on the south side of the street in that, in that area around between East and West street um, and that, that section there, it is a residential area. Uh, they have a kind of a calming effect on traffic as it goes through, um, which is definitely called for when you've got so many driveways and uh, entrances in the parking lots. Uh, the, the next point is that with trees in the median, it's they go all the way to the hub. And um, San Anselmo saw the value of trees uh, in accepting that uh, generous offer to, to redo their median when their elm trees died. And so I, I think we need to keep them uh, in San Rafael. And finally, I'd just like to say that the five parking spaces that Bill mentioned, um, there's parking available on East and West streets. You can remove those five parking spaces and the residents might have to walk, uh, you know, 50 yards extra rather than park in their driveway or park in their, um, in their garage. They want to park on the public street. This is, San Rafael property. Um, yeah, just they can they can just walk a little further. That's all. I was over there this morning. And there were plenty of places. There were several places to park. So um, it's not a, a big change. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Yeah. All right, that concludes. Just want to make sure, sorry. Okay, I've got another comment. Public comment As a resident of Second Street between East and West, we remain very concerned about the safety of entering and exiting our driveways across these many lanes of bike. We will also be very sad to lose what little neighborhood we feel we get from the current trees and would appreciate further beautification, which we've been requesting for years. Okay. And that concludes the public comments for this item. All right, thank you. We'll close uh, public, come back for a further uh, follow-up comment. Uh, Bill, if you could address uh, several questions that came up. Yeah, there were several questions. Um, we talked about the possibility of adding uh, additional trees in the median this afternoon based on the comments that we received. So that is a possibility to add trees in the median. Uh, we were really trying to accomplish a lot of things on the west end of San Rafael. Uh, there was a lot of concern expressed at the uh, public meeting we had in, uh, in September about the parking being lost on the street. And we do realize how important it is to uh, create a bike path here. I think Bill's right. Uh, the the uh, current situation with the sidewalk is is quite mean. It's uh, I think it gets down to about two feet in a couple places, and we're we're making it quite a bit wider with our bike path and sidewalk solution, where we do get a class four bike path and a real pedestrian uh, sidewalk on the side of the street there. So we we're making huge improvements in that area. 
we are planting new trees. Uh, it's true we would lose a few trees in the process, but we will be planting new trees there and we'll be exploring the opportunity of planting additional trees in the median, I think, uh, based on, on the comments today and, and what we heard tonight in the council meeting. Um, the uh, the concern about crossing the uh, bike path to get out of your driveway, I think that's a real concern. People do have to be careful getting out. That's why the green paint that was depicted in the image is shown there. It's a warning to both bicyclists and, and others that are passing through that that is a driveway. Uh, and that's a common uh, uh, demarcation for bike paths uh, where, where streets or, or uh, driveways are crossing those pathways. Um, we had a lot of discussion, and I'm going to ask Robert to jump in real quickly on this comment. Uh, Bill Carney brought up the uh, crosswalk on the west side of Lindaro. I know we had a lot of uh, discussion about that um, and concluded that that was inappropriate, but I'd like uh, Robert to jump in and just uh, let us know what the reasoning was there from a traffic engineering standpoint. Hey, Robert, or Bill, I'll chime in just because this that's part of the other project, the Kimley Horn project. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so the reason... The reason why we did not put a crosswalk on the west side is because we will have to uh, have more green time for the north direction and, and therefore less green time for the for the west direction on 3rd Street. So we'll actually, the light will be green longer, not for 3rd Street. So that's one of the things we considered is because if people are crossing on that west side, the cars on Lindaro can't make a left turn. Um, so it's just one of the, the things we we thought about. Thanks, April. I, I think that's the comments that I caught. If there's anything else that I missed, please uh, let me know. But those are the comments I heard tonight. That'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, comments, uh, Councilmember Bushy. Thank I you. Have a, I, I, I have a question. Uh, the Bill and team um, is 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 Bill Carney right? Um, if we took out five parking spots, could we save the trees? Uh, no. There was a different design there at one time. No. Sorry, I, I need a request for you to slow down a little bit, Bill. Thank Sorry you. about that. Um, should I speak louder also, Lindsay? Um, uh, the, the pathway we had there uh, before uh, did save, uh, I think, at least three of the four trees. Uh, so it is possible that that would be the case. But again, uh, there was a lot of concern for the neighbors above um, uh, Second Street. Uh, on east and west about the parking there. Um, I think parking is at a premium. The, the, the comment that was made earlier tonight, uh, just a few minutes ago, in fact, uh, was that, you know, in the morning, uh, you know, there are parking spaces, but those parking spaces are well utilized uh, overnight. And I think that's the concern that was expressed by the residents there. So just to give me the, the numbers again, we're up net 13 parking spots. So we're creating 13 more. There are 13 parking spaces there when this project is completed. Uh, it's a net number less than that, but we're eliminating several parking spaces between east and west. Uh, so it's it's a it's a net decrease in parking. Uh, Robert, again, wow. please correct me, uh, but, but we are saving as many parking spaces as we can between east and west street. Okay, so there's a net loss of parking. That's there correct, is, Robert. Yeah. Jump in if I'm not uh, if I'm misrepresenting that. Yeah. So there's so so there's a couple there's a couple of issues at play. Is that in order to get the uh, cycle track in there, we need to ensure that we have proper sight lines so that vehicles can exit their driveways, and that necessitates the removal of uh, a few additional stalls from what is there today. Okay, but that's not being driven by the trees. That is not being driven by the trees. And, and then one other really important point to make on this is that the multi-use pathway, uh, which was initially conceptually shown in the feasibility study, um, I think was a great idea. But one of the challenges we found is that um, there's a lot of residential driveways along this alignment, and we really don't want cyclists riding up against folks' driveways. We want to push the cyclists as far away from the driveways as possible. So is the trade-off the, the, the um, bike path? In order to have the bike path, we need to lose, we, we, it costs us the trees? The, the bike path creates a challenge for uh, two, of, two of the trees. The parking creates a challenge, a definite challenge for all of the trees. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good question. Anyone? Uh, anyone else? Mayor, Mayor, I'll just add that I know I know some of the public comment was concerned about us moving ahead on this tonight, but this is an informational report. So we're actually just giving information. There's no action other than the report being taken. So Correct. for the people that are still listening or couldn't give input, I just wanted to clarify that because we heard that more than once. Thank, thank, thanks for doing so. Any other comments? Seeing Councilmember Bushy, do you have a comment? No, I'm done. Oh, okay. Uh, Seeing none, is there a happy motion? To make a motion. I'm happy to make a motion that we accept the report on the third street improvements. Moved and second. Seconded. Roll call, please. Council Member Bushy. Aye. Vice Mayor Cullen. Aye. Council Member Gamblin. Aye. Council Member McCullen. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries five zero. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I I do need to. Uh, speak to an earlier item when uh, you're ready to call on me. I'm sorry? Uh -uh, with regard to the home key item, I just have a comment to make, if I may, please. We've already voted on the matter. I know that. I just wanted to clarify something about the uh, plans for you and Councilmember Gamlin to review the appraisal. May I speak to that? Um, I think it would be most appropriate uh, and I'll add that uh, we now uh, plan to meet at two o'clock tomorrow. Good. So I just wanted to make clear that while uh, the mayor and council member Gamblin do comprise the finance committee when that committee uh, meets for its um, noticed and agendized meetings with the next one of those uh, to be occurring on Wednesday, I believe, uh, the get together tomorrow at 2 p.m. that's planned between uh, Mayor Phillips and Council Member Gamblin will not be a finance committee meeting because there is not one agendized for tomorrow. Rather, those two council members will simply be uh, um, getting together to review the appraisal that will not be a meeting under the Brown Act because uh, they are less than a quorum and um, yet they uh, will we'll certainly be able to perform the function that was discussed and uh, was a part of uh, Councilmember uh, McCullough's excuse me, uh, motion. So I just wanted to make clear that this is not a finance committee meeting tomorrow and um, the finance committee members will have another opportunity to meet as the finance committee on Wednesday and address the uh, items on that agenda. And then thanks for the clarification by finance committee. I was making reference to uh, to uh, council member Gamble and myself being the council members on the uh, finance committee. So the shorthand, but uh, thanks for the further clarification. So yeah, we're gonna meet at two o'clock tomorrow. Uh, with that, uh, any council members reports or requests for future agenda items? Good. In which case, uh, since there's no successor agency uh, report, we shall adjourn. John, uh, John and I both have uh, someone uh, an individual we'd like to uh, recognize. John, starting with you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to turn this over to Vice Mayor Collin. Um, but I do I do want to recognize the fact that we lost a, a very substantial member of our community this week um, unexpectedly. Uh, uh, Tom Unterman, who whose family has been part of the Santa Fe community for over a hundred years, uh, specifically in the West End, as the owners of the West End Nursery. Uh, family-owned business since 1909, uh, suddenly passed away this, this week. Um, and uh, it's it's truly a loss for the city when we have a community member like that who's been so actively involved um, to, to pass suddenly. So I'm gonna turn it over to Vice Mayor Collin is right. that's in her neighborhood and her and, and, and knows the family very well. Kate, further comment? Yeah, no, I just I just wanted to add, I think it was shocking and I, I know my neighbors and I are distraught and not only was Tom an amazing nursery man and I was in my garden um, yesterday and, and futzing around and thinking of all the plants that he helped me pick out, um, but he was also giving back to the community on a lot of different levels and is a, a tremendous loss and, and, and my neighbors and I are going to feel it incredibly profound. And he was also giving back to the city. He was part of our um, wildfire prevention committee. So I think he said yes to everything community oriented. Um, so in his honor, I, I'm happy to say a few words. So thank you. Yes. And uh, Mayor Beth and I both served on the Wildfire Prevention Act Committee and uh, we appreciated his comments. Uh, I know 
in addition, unfortunately, uh, another well-known Santa Fe resident, uh, Jerry Bellato, who served on our planning commission and BPAC committee, this Sustainable San Rafael also passed away and I'd like to recognize and honor uh, Jerry uh, for all of his past service and uh, it's unfortunate of his passing, but we do wanna recognize him this evening in our adjournment, which we shall now do. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well.